Happy Sabbath. It sure is good to be back in Loma Linda after traveling. So Travel much. was great, but it's good to be back right here on the campus. It really is. And part of our values here at the Loma Linda University Church is growing disciples, but that means growing in areas of worship and study. Bible study and prayer. Also community, community and service and yes. service. So we have some different things we'd like to mention in each of those categories. And I think we have quite a few things coming up with worship and programming. Yeah, we're going to start off with worship. So very, at, right off the bat, we have a Vespers program coming up October 8. It's sponsored by the Association of Adventist Women. You're going to check our website for the information on that. It is followed by a banquet. The Vespers at 5 p.m. is free. The banquet, it is a ticketed event. You'll go to our website so you can register for that. Also in the category of worship, we're starting a brand new sermon series. Um, it's starting next week, October 1. And there's gonna be some a seminar in the afternoon. Here's Pastor Randy and Jamie Stadola to tell us more about that. I'm really looking forward to our fall sermon series. It's entitled Covenant. It's focused on strengthening our family relationships. We're gonna do some unique things. It'll have a bit of a back to the classroom feel, but important themes and topics for our families. It will be accompanied each Sabbath afternoon by covenant conversations. Jamie, you work with our care and counseling department. What are we looking at for the covenant conversations? Yes, we'll be continuing the conversation uh, regarding the sermon topic of that day. So each week will be a different topic at 4 p.m. here in room 1402. It will vary a little bit in how it's happening. We'll have some presentation, we'll have some conversation, Q&A kind of environment. And we look forward to having you there. The purpose here is to help strengthen our families. Amen. We look forward to you joining us for Covenant and for Covenant Conversations. And then one more special program that's happening next week, October 1st as well, is the Cal Baptist Choir and Orchestra at 5 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. If you haven't heard them, you're not gonna wanna miss them. And those are all that we have currently for worship. And then in the value of study, we have a new Sabbath school that is starting out. Our Sabbath schools are really our small groups as well here at the church. The Sabbath school starts October the 1st. It is called Peacemaker. This is a Sabbath school that is a biblical approach to conflict resolution. It'll be Sabbath mornings at 1030 in our new family ministry building. If you would like to be involved in this Sabbath school, they would actually like for you to fill out a, a form, a registration, so that they can keep it a small group and they also will have some materials that they will be distributing to you. So if that's of interest to you, go to our website and get more information. Next under the category of community, tonight at 7 p.m. at the Redlands Church, it's a combination of the Loma Linda University Church Crosswalk and the Redlands Church. It's fresh picked improv at 7 p.m. For a good laugh, our own Scotty Ray is involved and many others. You're not gonna to to miss it at 7 p.m. at the Redlands Church. Just saying his name made me laugh. <laughs> Scotty Ray is awesome. Hope yes. you guys come out for that. And then if you are looking for ways to serve, one of our, our values here at the church is to give back and to serve. And so next weekend is actually the Quilters, the 25th and the 26th of September. There's a correction, I think on our slide last week, it said October, but it actually is September the 25th and the 26th, that's Sunday, Monday. And that's this weekend, actually. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I'm losing it's track tomorrow. of time. Yes. It starts tomorrow. It's tomorrow. Yeah. It is in room 105. It starts at nine o'clock, goes to three. It's just a great time for community as well as making quilts for the children's hospital. They have a potluck, people bring some food. So it's a good time. If you are interested in helping out with that, please come out. There uh, is information on our website and Jody Rogers leads that and you, her phone number's there. You can give her a call if you have more questions. And then also we have our you reach they have some very urgent needs here take a look happy sabbath church my name is israel peralta i work with you reach as the community outreach coordinator as we move forward we have needs with the shower trailer and one of the biggest needs we have seen is for underwear and uh, we ask that you could please check out our Amazon wish list. You can see several different items, but we have also placed there underwear that you could buy in bulk. 
and it's going to be very helpful as people come to shower, they can come out with new undergarments. Also, we want to make a big request for more volunteers. We have several students on our wait list um, and we need more volunteers to come and help them either on a Monday, Tuesday or Thursday. It's only for an hour and a half. You let us know what day works best for you. It's from 6 to 7.30 p.m. You can check out the volunteer application for Excel on our website and you can also see the Amazon wish list on our Renew website. We continue to ask for your prayers. Thank you and happy Sabbath. And finally, it's hard to believe we're back to school already. In fact, next week is kind of the back to school bash and everything's going on. And Friday evening at 7.30 p.m., they're gonna have a sundown service. And then all four worship services, Sabbath morning, are gonna highlight the back to school. Just a reminder, the Anthem now has two services, one at 10 and 11.30. And so there's a lot going on and there's one more thing going on in the afternoon. There is. We're having the longest table, which originally started at Walla Walla College, so we need to give them a shout out yeah. for that. But we're going to try it down here, and I just want to say a huge thank you to the response that we have gotten for hosts. You guys have really um, given stepped back up to the, the yes and stepped up. So we actually have enough hosts now. So we just want to remind those of you who signed up to be a host that it will begin at 1.30. We'll get more details out to you. But again, this is just for university students and we are going to be partnering with the Campus Hill Church to provide over 50 tables for food for our students and this is a time just to get to know them and just to be hospitable well it's a great thing we're working with yeah. the chaplain department yes, on campus we are and then campus hill church and the loma Linda university church so really trying to be a university church campus uh, that, that loves on our students that's right they need food to start the school year <laughs> <laughs> right. well that's our announcements for today as always for the latest information go to our website lluc.org we sure do love you guys, and we hope that this Sabbath day is a blessing to each and every one of you. Have a great Sabbath.
Let's all stand and sing our call to worship together. You may be seated. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. That sounds pretty good for the first time. I'm surprised. Let's do it again. I think we can get a little better. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Happy amen, amen. It is truly good to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen? amen. And it's good to see your beautiful, smiling faces on this beautiful day. And we welcome you to the worship services here at the Loma Linda University Church. We welcome each of you who are here in person as well as those of you who may be watching online, especially those of you who may be at home sick or in your hospital bed, we want you to know that we are praying for you. We want to give a very special welcome to some of our pastors and some of our members who are back from their Asia Minor tour. They've been gone for a few weeks. We praise God for his traveling mercies and bring them back. Someone say amen. amen. You know, David said, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I can imagine you said that after you had a wonderful meal. For me, it would have been like eating maybe a vegan macaroni and cheese meal, or maybe a vegan, some vegan ice cream. Have mercy, I can only imagine. Now, let me ask you, if, let me say, if you are in need of a spiritual blessing today, I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, I am in need of a delicious spiritual meal today. I know y'all thinking about going home and eating lunch after this is over right now, right? Let's keep it spiritual. Well, I want you to know today that Pastor Joey has prepared a sumptuous spiritual meal for us today. And after you've eaten it, digested it, and enjoyed it, do like you do your regular meals. Go and let someone else know. As a disciple of Jesus Christ, let someone else know how wonderful it was for you so that they can enjoy it as well. Welcome, welcome to worship. May we stand for our hymn of praise.
Let us enter into the holy presence of our Lord and King on bended knee. Father in heaven, the world is dark, and you are holy and full of light. We ask that you will bless us again with the light of your gospel, of your glory. Lord, may we sense the presence of your Holy Spirit in our lives, and may we be light unto that dark world. Lord, so many of our members have suffered great loss this week. Dear Lord, my family has suffered great loss this week. And I ask that you will be with those who remain. Be with them and may they sense your presence and be assured of your great plan of salvation, of reuniting with you and our loved ones. Dear Lord, I ask that you will be with each member in this sanctuary. Will you be with each member of our community who are watching online as they suffer and endure the hardships and even the pain of sickness and loss. Dear Lord, may we find a way to lift those around us up, to care for those in need. I ask, Lord, that you will let Jesus shine through our countenance to this world. Dear Lord, we ask that you will be with the children of this church. May they see Jesus in us, and may we provide a model for them that makes them want to pursue discipleship, Bless those of us who want to be a disciple of the Lord. Help us that we might grow and help others to grow as the new members, the new students of this community, of this great university come to the campus this next week. Lord, may they find a beacon here at this church and may they see Jesus in each of us. Dear Lord, be with the pastors on this church. May we represent you well. Be with the teachers and the leaders of this church in their duties. Lord, we look forward to being together in that great heavenly day when you return. Until that time, Lord, we ask that you will be with us. Give us courage, give us faith, and may we find solace in your sweet word. In Jesus' name, amen. She went to the temple of Jerusalem, and she was used to be unnoticed. She was not a prominent woman, just a poor widow. And she had a lot of loss in her life. But still, for some reason, she found reasons to give back to God. And then he gave. She gave everything she had. Little she knew that God himself was looking at her really close by. And then Jesus taught a lesson to his disciples and to all of us. This woman had no idea that her story would be taught for generations. Because when we come to worship, we're worshiping that same God that notice us, sees us, cares for us. And I know you know, I know that as well. But I think that when we come to worship, it's a good time to just dwell in that reality. His sigh is on the sparrow, and yes, he watches us. He sees, he loves, he cares. And that's the reason we give. With a cheerful heart, just like her, so as the deacons collect tithes and offerings, I pray that we dwell in that reality. He knows us and he loves us. Amen. <laughs>
Good morning, boys and girls. Come on up front for the children's feature. Now this morning, you can come, just come straight up here. We're not going to have the lamb's offering, but we will be resuming October 8th. So I know the rest of you are saving your dollars, maybe your 20s or 100s. <laughs> So come on up, come have a seat here. We're going to do some fun things together today. Do we have any boys and girls? Oh, yes. Go ahead, have a seat. Yeah. Come sit down here on the steps. Oh, this morning I wanted to talk to you about something that maybe you remember teacher Chris or teacher Scotty talking about for the last two weeks. It is called myths. Do any of you, do you remember what a myth is? Let me test you. Do you remember? Mm, okay, a myth is something that we believe that is true and it's not necessarily true. Sometimes it's a lie. The best way that I knew how to tell you what a myth is, when we open up our heart to Jesus, our heart is clean and pure, but Satan wants us to believe it is not, and he gives us lies, and he makes us think that no matter how much we ask for forgiveness, we're always going to be crumpled and we're never going to have a clean new heart. And that's a myth. Well, let me see if this helps a little bit more too, how we can tell. I'm going to have you take one of these and pass it along. And over here, take one of these and pass it along. For those of you who are watching, it's a piece of sandpaper. Does everybody have a piece of sandpaper? Pass it along, take one. Here you go, sweetheart. Now I want you to take this piece of sandpaper and I want you to rub it on your hand. Ouch! Does that feel good? No, it's rough. If I kept doing this, I think I would even get a sore. It hurts. It's painful. It does not feel good. And you know what? Jesus, um, Satan makes us feel the lies that we hear makes them feel like they are rough. Like for instance, maybe when you think, oh, I'm not good enough. Oh, I'm terrible. Jesus is never gonna forgive me. The mistake that I made is so terrible, I just can't think that Jesus would be okay with that and would forgive me, and it feels rough. Now, contrary to that, go ahead and pass a little cotton ball around. Pass it around, here you go. Now, what does a cotton ball feel like? Oh, it's so soft and fluffy. In fact, it feels so good, you could probably even rub your face with it. Yeah. When we use words like, I am sorry, I forgive you, and we mean it, or I did not mean to say or do that. Can you please forgive me? It's like we open up our hearts to Jesus and he can invite us to be tender and loving to others. Satan wants, to wants us to believe that we are all crumpled up and that we can't be healed but Jesus helps us to be kind and tender towards others. So, boys and girls, Pastor Joey is going to be speaking about forgiveness today. I 
want you to know that it's okay if during the sermon you rub your hand with your cotton and think about what he's going to say to us. Thank you so much. You can go back to your seats now. There's some more. Thank you. Yeah, you can keep it. You can take it with you. I think there's some more up here. I would like to invite the Luna family up here to join me this morning. Come on up. It is such a pleasure to have this beautiful family up here with me. The Luna family, this is Jordan and Charity. This is Ethan and Leah. Jordan actually works at Happy Money, and Charity works as a designer developer for Blue Sky. And Ethan, well, what I can say about Ethan, he loved VBS, didn't you? And Ethan, how old are you? Can you tell everybody how old you are? He's four years old, yes. And he loves telling all kinds of stories at Barton Play School where he attends preschool. And I can only imagine what kind of stories he shares. <laughs> but then today we are here because of little Leah. I have to say, one thing that I've noticed, Leah loves music and she comes alive. So when Charity emailed me this week and said, Leah loves music, I was like, yes, she does. When those instruments come out in Sabbath school, you just bang them away and you just love to sing. And even when they came early and they heard the choir, she right away stopped and looked around. Yes, you sure did. Well, Jordan and Charity have been involved in children's ministries. They have been involved in our soccer league and in uh, Sabbath school, and we're just so happy to have them part of children's ministries. Now, they did write some of their hopes that they have for Leah, and I would love to share that with you this morning. We hope that Leah always keeps a song in her heart. We hope she gets her music from Mama. <laughs> a memory verse that we love for her to recite one day and to remember. Every good and perfect gift is from the Lord, found in James 1.17. Well, they have a huge support system, and I would love for family and friends to stand in support of the Luna family. Right over here, Jordan, Charity. These are people in your lives who pour positively and spiritually into your lives. Thank you so much. You can be seated. Now, Leah, will you come to me? Come here. We practiced this earlier and it went really well. Let's go ahead and bow our heads for prayer. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, Leah has so much to say, Lord, because she already loves Sabbath school and she loves being part of church. Lord, this morning, we just ask a blessing on the Luna family. As they raise little Ethan and Leah, may you give Jordan and Charity wisdom. May little Leah love you all, the, all of her life, Lord, and always want to follow you. We just ask you to bless this little family today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Oh. Oh, she has lots to say. <laughs> Thank you so much. Happy Sabbath.
Happy Sabbath, church family. Our scripture reading today is taken from Luke 19, verses 1 to 10, in the New International Version. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times that amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. Comedian Steve Martin once said, before you criticize a man, walk a mile in his shoes. That way, when you do criticize him, you'll be a mile away and wearing his shoes. <laughs> we live in a society where it's becoming increasingly easy to criticize people from a mile away. In February of 2020, Country music star Garth Brooks gave a concert in Detroit, Michigan. And he did it while wearing the jersey of retired Detroit Lions running back Barry Sanders. Anybody here know who Barry Sanders is? A few of you. And one of the greatest running backs of all time. But this photo that Garth Brooks posted on his social media page caused some confusion among his fans because they saw the name Sanders and the number 20 and they thought that he was conveying support for Senator Bernie Sanders, who was at that time running for president. And the, the backlash was immediate and it was intense. Here's a few examples. Good grief, responded one Instagram user. Can't you just do what you get paid to do? Why, why does it have to involve politics? Three exclamation points. So sad. We don't pay good money for anything other than to watch you perform. Wow. <laughs> Thought you were different. Another wrote, weird that a millionaire would like a socialist. Hey, Garth, are you going to distribute your millions? Only on the internet, right? But before we judge these people too harshly, it's important to remember that we too can very easily slip into this critical mindset. I mean, think back to this past week. How many times have you seen someone do something that you disagreed with and had your mind immediately jump to criticism? Just as an experiment this week, I decided to keep track of how many times I did that. And let me tell you, the results were not pretty. I'm not gonna give you the actual number because I don't wanna tempt you to judge me. <laughs> but it was high, it was high. I mean, I found myself judging pharmacy clerks for how they arrange the aisles. I mean, why would they put the adult Claritin in one aisle and the children's Claritin in a different aisle? I found myself judging people at Costco Gas who waited until they got to the pump to look for their membership card. I mean, what were they doing during the 30 minutes they were in line, right? <laughs> I found myself judging people on the road, right? This is a common one for running, for cutting in front of people, for uh, rolling through stop signs, right? It's a stop sign, not a roll sign, right? I see some of you nodding your heads in agreement. I see others of you judging me for judging you. <laughs> the truth is, 
We like to judge people. We like to criticize people. It makes us feel good about ourselves. And, the, and, and social media has created a venue where we can publish and distribute our, our, our opinions and our judgments about anything, everywhere, from behind a keyboard. And that's created a culture where criticisms are louder than caring, where we're judged more by our failures than our feats, and where sometimes some failures seem so bad that they feel final. They feel like no matter what we do, no matter how hard we try, once we've made that critical mistake, there's just no coming back from it. And so while we, while we judge others, we secretly wonder if others are judging us. Are we also being judged? If my private decisions became public knowledge, would I be mocked? Would I be canceled? Would I be rejected? See, we're at the end of a series examining dangerous myths that, that shape our beliefs and drive our behaviors. And there's no more dangerous myth than this. Some failures are final. Because that message is antithetical to the central theme of Scripture. And it is opposite, the opposite of what Jesus came here to do. So if that, that is a myth then how do we ensure that our failures aren't final? Well, to answer that question, we're going to take a look at an encounter between Jesus and, and a man who had been told that his failures are final. Scott and Lolita just read about them in the passage for today. It's found in Luke chapter 19, starting with verse 1. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open them up, turn them on, flip over to Luke chapter 19. We're going to start in verse 1. And Luke writes, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. Now, this account that we're about to read occurs in the middle section of the book of Luke. Luke divides his gospel into three major sections. In the first one, he describes Jesus' ministry in Galilee. In the middle one, he describes Jesus' journey from Galilee to Jerusalem. And the last one describes his ministry in Jerusalem, which ultimately culminates in Jesus' death. So these, these sections are arranged more thematically than they are chronologically. And the theme of that middle section is that there is no one outside of the reach of the Savior. There is no one who is outside of the reach of the Savior. So in account after account, we see Luke describes how Jesus brings outsiders in. A blind beggar, a bleeding woman, a bunch of lepers. Those whom society had rejected, Jesus restores. And there is no one, no outsider that the people in, in the book of Luke love to hate more than Zacchaeus. Verse 2, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. So there's three facts that Luke wants us to understand about Zacchaeus. The first was that he was the chief tax collector. And taxes were very controversial back then. It's not like now where we love to pay our taxes and can't wait for April 15 to roll around, right? No? No? Well, as much as we hate paying taxes, they hated paying taxes even more because the Romans had conquered the Jews, and then they forced the Jews to pay the Romans for the privilege of being a part of their empire. I mean, that would be like me walking into your home and charging you rent for the privilege of living in your own home, right? And, and, and so the tax collectors were Jews who enforced these Roman tax laws on other Jews. And the worst part was that they benefited from their betrayal. They could set the taxes as high as they wanted, and as long as the Romans got their cut, the tax collectors could keep the rest. And so they were despised. They were despised by their community. They, they, they were on the same level as con men, cheats, Dallas cowboys, right? I mean, everybody hated them. <laughs> Nobody liked them. Amen? Amen? No? You know, think about how you feel when you hear 
uh, about people like Bernie Madoff, Harvey Weinstein, people who take advantage of others for their own benefit. That's who these tax collectors were. And Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector. That's the first thing, the first fact that Luke wants us to understand about Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector. The second fact was that he was rich. He was rich, which means that he benefited a lot from his unsavory profession. He was very good at doing very bad things. That's how he became rich. That's how he became the chief tax collector. So if there was anybody out there who deserved to be rejected, if there was anybody out there who deserved to be canceled, if there was anybody out there who, who deserved to have his failures be final, it was Zacchaeus. But lucky for him, his story does not end there. Because there is one more fact that Luke wants us to understand about Zacchaeus, and it makes all the difference in the world to Jesus. It's found in verse 3. Zacchaeus wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. You know, a lot of times we get sidetracked by the fact that Zacchaeus was short, that he was a wee little man. But that's not really Luke's focus. What Luke wants us to understand is that Zacchaeus was desperately seeking the Savior. See, this was no mild curiosity for him. He didn't, he wasn't there for the show. He was there for an encounter with the Savior. He wasn't there for curiosity. He was there to meet the Christ. And we see this by how he behaves. He doesn't give up at the first sign of difficulty. You know, when the crowd tries to box him out, and they did. I mean, the way that Luke describes it, they are actively trying to keep Zacchaeus away from Jesus. You know, that's an ongoing theme in the book of Luke. The crowd often gets between the seeker and the Savior. When the demoniac clung to Jesus, the crowd pushed Jesus away. When the bleeding woman tried to reach Jesus, the crowd formed a barrier around him. And when the blind man tried to call out to Jesus, the crowd tried to silence him. The crowd often gets between the seeker and the Savior. And I wonder, do we ever behave like the crowd? Do we ever get between the seeker and the Savior? Do we, by our actions, by our words, by our belief that some failures are final, do we ever get between the seeker and the Savior? I, I wonder. But Zacchaeus, despite the crowd's best efforts, will not be denied. And so he casts aside his dignity and pride, and he runs, runs to that tree and climbs up into it, which, which adults in that culture just did not do. They didn't run, and they certainly did not climb trees. And so writing about this passage, uh, theologian Robert Stein says, such undignified behavior, according to that culture, indicates that more than curiosity was at play here. See, Zacchaeus wasn't there for the show. He was there for the Savior. See, that's the third fact that Luke wants us to understand about Zacchaeus, that he was desperately seeking the Savior. And that made all the difference to Jesus. See, the crowd only cared about the first two facts. They saw a chief tax collector who had gotten rich by taking advantage of others, and they didn't care about the rest. And they were so focused on his past mistakes, they couldn't, they couldn't see his present motivations. They were so blinded by the size of his sin that they didn't care that he was seeking the Savior. But Jesus did. That was the only fact that mattered for Jesus, that he was seeking Jesus. See, Zacchaeus' past couldn't prevent him from having a future with Jesus, because no failure is final if we seek the Savior. Amen? No failure is final if we seek the Savior. And we see that in verse 5. When Jesus reached that spot, 
he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. So this is no chance encounter. Luke makes it very clear that Jesus came this way to meet Zacchaeus. He he writes, I must stay at your house today. And the word that we translate must, it it connotes a, a, a divine necessity. Right? Luke uses this word in his gospel whenever he wants to, to indicate that this event, this occurrence was a part of God's plan for Jesus' life. Like Luke chapter 4, verse 43, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom. Luke chapter 9, verse 22, the Son of Man must suffer many things. And then again in the same verse, he must be killed and on the third day raised to life. These were divinely ordained appointments. So meeting Zacchaeus on the road that day was just as much a, a part of God's plan for Jesus' life as his death on the cross. Did you hear me? Meeting Zacchaeus on that road today was as much a part of God's plan for Jesus' life as his death on the cross. Think about that for a moment. Zacchaeus had just gone through extraordinary measures to reach Jesus. I mean, he had gone full-on stalker fan on Jesus. He climbed a tree, hung from a branch, just just to catch a glimpse of Jesus. And then Jesus shows up and says, I came all this way for you. I must stay at your house today. See, what's so incredible about this moment is as hard as Zacchaeus fought to be with Jesus, Jesus fought harder to be with Zacchaeus. I mean, Jesus didn't just come from Galilee. He left the glories of heaven above, cast his dignity and pride aside, and ran, ran to earth and climbed upon a dying tree to be with Zacchaeus. And if you forget everything else I say today, remember this. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter what choices you've made, no failure is final because our Savior seeks for us. Our Savior seeks for us. So our friends may abandon us. Our family may disown us. Our community may cancel us, but Jesus will never stop loving us. The same Savior who who battled the storm and crossed the lake in order to free the demoniac seeks for you. The same Savior who heard the cries of a blind man over the shouts of the crowd seeks for you. The same Savior who felt the touch of a bleeding woman in the midst of the press of the crowd seeks for you. For you, the same Savior who came all the way from Galilee to meet a tax collector hanging from a tree seeks for you. No failure is ever final because our Savior seeks for you. See, Jesus, Jesus is a lot like GPS, you know? He's a lot like GPS. Do you remember those times when, before GPS, we had to use paper maps to try to figure out how to get to places we wanted to go? Do you remember those times, those days? Yeah? Anybody still have paper maps? A few of you, okay, that's great. I remember when I moved down to LA for the first time, a church member gifted me with a Thomas Guide. You know what a Thomas Guide is? It's like a thick book of maps. Now the choir knows Thomas Guide. Yeah, and I, 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 if I wanted to find out how to get to a place I had never been to before, you'd have to look up the address, right, in the appendix and find out what page it was found on and then sort of reverse navigate yourself all the way back to your starting point, right? That's how you figured out where, and this all happened before you even got into the car. So much work. But then we got MapQuest. Anybody here remember MapQuest? And then all you had to do was type in an address, and boom, you could print out, actually print on paper, directions to where you wanted to go. The only problem was, if you ever got off track, right, 
If you ever got lost, made the wrong turn, then might as well go home because there was no map for that, you know? But then we got GPS, and all of a sudden, traveling to new places was easier than ever before, because all you had to do was type in your address, and and you didn't even have to know where you were going initially. You just just followed the the、uh, the step by step instructions of how to get there. And now we don't even need the address, right? We just say the place we want to go, and magically, our GPS figures out what the address is. And even even if we get off track. Even if we get lost, we make the wrong turn. The GPS tries to get us back on track, right? Like, what happens when you make the wrong turn? What does the GPS say? Rerouting. Yes, I can see that some of you also ignore your GPS at times. <laughs> rerouting. It says rerouting, and it doesn't matter how many times I miss that same turn. The GPS never gets frustrated. It never gives up. It keeps on rerouting and rerouting because the GPS never stops seeking for you. It never stops trying to get you back on the right track. All you have to do is be willing to follow. And Jesus is a lot like GPS. He never stops seeking for us. He never stops trying to get us back on the right track. All we have to do is be willing to follow. All we have to do is be willing to allow God to reroute our lives. You know that's what repentance is. Repentance is just a fancy word for God rerouting our lives. Literally, the word means a changing of directions, turning around. We were going on one course, and Jesus took us on a different course. Right? He reroutes our lives. So, how do we repent in a way that God can reroute our lives? How do we repent in a way that we can can be better? Well, that's a good question to ask because there's been some confusion about what repentance is. You know, some people think of repentance as confession followed by punishment, right? We say we're sorry, and someone meets out、uh, an appropriate amount of punishment for us. But that is not the biblical model of repentance, because repentance is not about retribution; it's about restoration. Did you catch that? Repentance is not about retribution; it's about restoration. It's not about retribution; it's not about making sure that the person, the offender. Experiences the same amount of pain that they cause someone else. It's not about retribution; it's about restoration. It's about allowing God to repair us so that we can be better. So then, how do we do that? How do we how do we repent in a manner that allows God to reroute our lives and allows us to be better? Well, we start by doing what Zacchaeus did. See, he recognized what he did wrong. He started by recognizing what he did wrong. That's the first step in this process of repentance. The reason why Zacchaeus goes searching for Jesus is because he recognized that he had made some mistakes, that he had gotten off God's course for his life. He recognized what he did wrong, and if we want God to be able to reroute our lives, we also need to recognize fully what we've done wrong. How have we hurt others? How have we hurt ourselves? How have we hurt God? How have we added to the brokenness of this world? Recognize what we've done wrong, and that kind of admission—it's not easy, because it's deeply painful. And so, a lot of times, instead, we try to minimize what we've done rather than maximize our admission. It's kind of like the guy who cheated on his taxes. And he felt so guilty about it, he couldn't sleep at night. So finally, he wrote a letter to the IRS saying, "I cheated on my taxes. I I put the wrong numbers down. Here's a check for fifteen hundred dollars." And then he added, "If I still can't sleep, I'll send you the rest." <laughs> See, we laugh, but 
the truth is that's exactly what we do. We try to minimize what we've done instead of maximize our admission because it's painful. But that is the only way that we can begin this process where God reroutes our lives and helps us to be better. We have to make a full confession and ask for forgiveness. So that's the first step in the process of repentance. Recognize what we've done wrong. The second step is to realize why we've done wrong. Once we've recognized what we've done wrong, we have to realize why we did that. So so the process of, of, of repentance begins with confession, but it continues to self-examination. That's why the psalmist in Psalm 139 writes, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. See, our outward sin is a result of inward sinfulness. I love how Dr. George Knight describes this. He writes, Eve committed sin in capital letters when she loved herself and her desire more than she loved God and his will. She committed sin in her heart. And that sin in her heart led to the taking and eating of the fruit. Sin in the heart leads to sins in terms of actions. Something happens in the heart first. First, there is sin in the heart, and then sin in the heart then gives birth to sinful actions. Thus, sin leads to sins. Notice that Dr. Knight associates sin with love. Because sin at its core is a misplaced love. It's loving something or someone more than we love God. So all of our actions of sin, they stem from a love for something. Love for power, for wealth, for influence, for belonging, for comfort, for pleasure. And none of these things are bad. But when we love these things so much, more than we love God, we are willing to sin in order to get them, right? That at the core is what sin is. It is a misplaced love. So what is the desire that drives our behavior? What is the sin, what is the love that drives our sin? See, one person may lie because they want to belong. They want people to accept them, so they lie about themselves. Other people may lie because they want to control and manipulate others. The outward action is the same, but the inward love or desire is different. So if we want, if we want God to be able to reroute our lives, if we want to be better, we not only have to recognize what we've done, we have to realize why we did it to go through that process of self-examination. And then once we've completed that second step, we can move to the third, the how. How do we begin to repair some of the damage we've done? See, the incredible thing about God is that God doesn't take away our agency. And here's what I mean by that. You don't have to be a parent very long before you realize that we can't do everything for our children. Otherwise, we stunt their growth, right? So even if we can do something better, we allow them to do it so that they can learn and grow. That's what they call in psychological circles, giving them a sense of agency or a sense of control. And God, like a great parent, does not take away our agency, which is why he invites us to partner with him in, in helping to repair some of the messes that we've made. I mean, notice that in this encounter with Zacchaeus, that the process of repentance began when he recognized what he had done. But it's only when he begins to repair some of his messes that Jesus says to him, today salvation has come to this house. I mean, take a look, verse eight. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. 
And it is after he says this, after he makes a commitment to repair some of the damage that he's done, that Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. And then I love how this passage ends. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's why Jesus came, to seek sinners. Friends, this process of repentance is not easy. It's very hard. It's going to take us fighting. We may have to cast down our dignity and pride, maybe even climb a few trees to get there. But it is the only way that God can reroute our lives. It's the only way that God can make us better. So, I encourage you to begin this process of repentance. Because as hard as we're fighting to be with Jesus, Jesus is fighting even harder to be with us. So, recognize what? Realize why and begin to repair some of the mess we've made, and we'll discover that no failure is ever final because we have a Savior who never stops seeking for us. Discouraged, and why should the shadows come? And why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven? and home when Jesus is my portion I come for friend is he his eye is on the sparrow And I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. And I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eyes on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. And I know he watches me. Will you sing that chorus with me again? I sing because I'm happy. Oh, sing it out loud. I sing, I sing because I'm free. And I know, and I know he watches me. 
Romeo, his eyes on the sparrow, his eyes on the sparrow. And I know he watches, and I know he watches, and I know he watches. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for your promises that are so true. For the words of this hymn that are so true today. When the world is trying to push us apart from you, may we have the courage to climb up and look at you. And so if we get just a glimpse of you, we will know that you're still watching upon us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you please remain seated as we enjoy the postlude? Thank you.
to Week in Review. I'm Sheila Hodgkin here with Ganem. Everyone knows Ganem. How are you, Ganem? Everyone knows Sheila. <laughs> I am blessed and I trust you as well. I am too. We're, we're blessed. And I know you're blessed out there too. And um, our verse of the day, can I start with that? Please. But the Lord watches over those who fear him, those who rely on his unfailing love. Psalms 33, 18. That's really beautiful and comforting, isn't it? It really is, because um, if, if we pray, we know that he listens and he hears us. And if we love him and fear him, we know he's watching over us. So. And if we're under his watch, why should we fear anything? Although we're humans mm -hmm. and we do experience fear and insecurities uh, and stress. But at the end of the day, if we keep reminding ourselves, who is our father? And then... We should have nothing to worry about. That's right. Nothing to worry about when we have God as our Father. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for choosing that verse. Well, I love that verse. That's been a, been a stronghold for me. So, love that. What do we have for sponsors? We do. We have the Bliss family from Georgia, the Jacob family from Pennsylvania, the Gilbert family from Alabama, and the Marshall family from Tennessee, God bless you, and we thank you so much for sponsoring this hour. We have sponsors every 24-7, and um, but we specifically are thanking these sponsors for this hour, so thank you very much. Yeah, and you said, you're absolutely right. It's miraculous. It is amazing, heartwarming. Every half hour throughout a 24-hour cycle, we have sponsors. Now, they don't choose the half hour or hour. It is our computer system. Just kind of select the Sabbath, you know, those who happen to be read on the Sabbath life hours. Uh, so it just kind of randomly keeps picking up the, the names. But every time you watch LLBN, you have to remember the amazing faith by all those names who appear on the screen. What a faith in God's work that they're putting their trust in a ministry from distance mm -hmm. to help us go in the airways and get back on the grounds in every city around the world. That's right. We have wonderful prayer partners and wonderful viewers like you that support this ministry. We can't do it without you. So Amen. God bless you. So big thank you. And absolutely, I second that over and over again. God bless you for your support. You are our congregation. You are the family of this ministry that keeps going for 27 years now, Sheila. Oh, 27, just as old as I am. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't doubt that. But, but for those of us who've been in it from day one till now, it has just been a phenomenal journey seeing not what we did, but what God allowed us to do and what God empowered us to do. A testimony for all believers, if you believe in him and put your faith in him, whether in personal life, ministry, or business, he will get you through all troubles. He will get you through everything and help you to cross and accomplish many milestones. Amen. Amen. That's right. Well, we had a wonderful Christian Connections, and if you missed it, this last Tuesday live, you get to watch it one more time. Right, Adam? That's right. I'm actually looking forward to watch I this one watch again. I want to watch it again. We had the wonderful Dr. Anthony Hilliard, and he talked about um, eating to live and living to eat, you know, uh, which one's better. You'll have to tune in and, and find out. I sincerely say this is one you don't want to miss because you don't hear these topics, these discussions coming from scientific people. You go on the internet, YouTube, Google, whatever, and you get hodgepodge of variety of information and answers so very from answer to answer for on the same topic that you search. But here it's presented scientifically. And if you see all the credentials that Dr. Hilliard has, you will trust what he is telling us. So tune in for yes. the replay. It, it is outstanding. And I, I love how s s the science and the spirituality, the trust in God. That's right. Goes together. So don't miss it. And, and that's this wonderful music we had too. And that's an excellent point you raised about the mixture, you know. And he puts it so simple for all of us to understand. He, you know, as, as, as advanced he is scientifically, he brought it in, into very, very average language for all of for us to every understand. every language, for me. 
for people well, for like me. me. So, <laughs> if I can understand it, you will too. So. All right, what we got next? Well, we also have um, the angel's message. There's a two-hour special coming up. You want to talk That's about that, That's correct. Gavin? That's correct. So this coming Tuesday, mark your calendar. It's a very, very special program. Uh, we're trying to bring you one each month. A two-hour special, a mixture of music, discussion, sermons, and variety of topics. Uh, the three angels' message are a part. The three angels' message are a part of the prophecy of Revelation 13 through 14 that contrasts true and false worship and the battle between Jesus and Satan. These messages are directly from Jesus to his people. They are an invitation to each individual and an end time imperative. So uh, it is deep. Uh, most Adventists are familiar with the three angels message. But, you know, it doesn't hurt to always hear it from another teacher's perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's going to be that message is going to be broken down into four segments uh, uh, to be presented by Dr. Uh, uh, Roger Schwelt. So. Oh, awesome. I love him, too. And he's another wonderful doctor that puts he, it together for us. He is indeed. Succinctly. So, well, especially being a scientific person, he knows how to assemble the blocks in a way mm -hmm. that it all connects. And he had his st studies in theology himself. So, so we thank God for this opportunity. So Tuesday, 6 p.m., live Pacific time here on His Word channel. And we also have uh, the October SLS schedule. And Ganem, do you have that schedule down, Pack? Mm -hmm. So make sure to go to LLBN.TV, the same website. We have all our resources there for you. Uh, click on schedules on the top of the screen, as you see on the screen, uh, and have a pull down win uh, window. Or you can click on the channel name, SLS, and that will get you directly to that channel page. And in there, you'll be able to click on schedule and see the schedule. Uh, there are lots of new programs airing on that channel. Uh, you definitely want to uh, uh, watch Dr. Hilliard. Hilliard. He has his own series now, uh, premiering October 2nd on Smart Lifestyle TV. We call it SLS, uh, and as well as uh, another series by Dr. Roger Schwelt. Uh, on health as well, among many other health programs. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, our health channel, it is just growing left and right in all directions worldwide and heavily in America and Canada because of its uh, 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 scientific-based health teaching. And again, it's not the hodgepodge, you know, confusion of information as you find on YouTube or Google or yes, other places. Yes. That's great. That's so, wonderful. I can't wait. You have to tune in and make sure to check your schedule. And, Ganon, we also want to tell you we are just so grateful for the growth of this ministry. For 27 years, it has just grown exponentially. And um, that's due to God. We take no credit, but just from God through all of you folks. And um, we want to thank the board and the senior leadership. Anything to add with that? Yes, I, I do want to say something about the... Our board members are the most incredible, gentle-hearted, yet brilliant business people who have done all kind of business in their, throughout their careers, and they're loving and humble to be part of our organization. Uh, I just don't know what we would have done without our board. Um, Sheila, you're one of our board members, as I am. Uh, so, uh, but we do have a board of uh, 14 members, and it's just an incredible. And the senior leadership, also all God-loving people, who have dedicated their life to this ministry. So thank you to LLBN board members. Thank you to our senior leadership for their contributions, love, and support to ministry of LLBN. That's right. Just, it's a blessing to be part of it um, in any way, and we just thank you so much for supporting, for your prayers. Um, you know, you have, if you can give whatever you can in your prayers, there's tax-deductible gifts. Um, $150, you know, to keep it going 24-7, or, you know, it used to be $150 per square foot, but since we've got it built, we're moving towards getting everything, all the mechanical things that need to be done with the ministry to make sure it's brought to you live and, and programming is there and to help um, with the ministry of LLBN. Amen, amen. We thank you so much for that. You know, I'm not ashamed to ask because it's for God's work. I'm not ashamed 
to ask even people in my community, my family, my brothers, my sisters, when I run into them, I encourage them to give this, this ministry as a donor volunteer myself, as Sheila is as well. It's, it's again, it's, we're not ashamed to ask because it is for his glory to honor God, and especially in those days where the gospel has to be preached all throughout the land. And that's exactly what God empowered us here at LLBN to do, to share the good news of Jesus through so many channels, 24-7, nonstop around the world, Amen. for the $150 an hour. Some folks are able to support 10 minutes, and you know what? That 10 minutes is significant because it does go worldwide, and that 10 minutes help us get around the world, and others able to support 15 or 30 or one hour, and many and I, many have also support a bulk of hours. So thank you for not being ashamed to give us what you can afford because all together, the small and the big, all counts, all counts together, and at the end of each month, we continue to pay our bills for satellite expenses, internet expenses. It's in the tens of thousands of dollars just for the internet. Uh, every viewer who receives the gospel of Jesus who log in, who logs in for every minute, there's costs incurred to LLBN. And you folks, the good folks out there, who's making that possible. Amen. Sheila, should we share a letter or two? Yes. Greg and Thelma from California write, we have enclosed a gift to help with LLBN's ever-growing outreach. Please use it wherever it is needed most. We lift up the LLBN ministry and its team members in our daily prayers. And Harold from Oklahoma says, the Sabbath church services you show are a blessing in our home. I've arranged to put these ceremonies on our local city-owned TV channel as part of a cable TV service to our town. Thank you, LLBN. Oh, God bless you. Harold, thank you so much, Greg and Thelma. We'd love to pray for you. Gannon, would you please pray yes, for Yes, mighty God in heaven, we lift up Greg and Harold before you. Uh, what a great servants of yours. Uh, and there's so many like them out there, Father, uh, just eager to serve your work and to share the good news of your son Jesus into the world. Bless them richly as we ask you to bless all our viewers and all those who love you who are under your watch to be with them and bless them all as you bless this ministry and all of us here at LLB. Thank you, Father. In your name, we Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sabbath. Stay tuned for church service. Happy Sabbath, friends. It's been an incredible journey walking with you through the crucible. We've discussed the various challenges of the crucible throughout scriptures and also in our lives. And now we are in the final Sabbath of the quarter, looking at how Christ also stepped into the crucible in order to rescue us from it. But before we begin, let's bow our heads for prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to guide us in this discussion. Our good and gracious Father, we want to thank you so much for being a God who did not stand on the sidelines, but you as the God had stepped into the crucible, are continuing to step in the crucible with us. And so as we talk about, as we finish up this study about how we face challenges on an almost daily basis in the crucible, we ask that you continue to be with us, give us wisdom, guidance, and most of all, encouragement that you will never let us go. This is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. So I am joined today with by my friend and colleague, Jesse. Jesse, it's so great to have you on again. Yeah. Pastor Miguel, for those of you who are not aware, is still on his trip to Asia Minor. Last I heard, he was in Greece. And so this is an opportunity for Jesse to step in and, and to discuss this final lesson with us. How are you doing, Jesse? I'm doing great. Glad to be here. 
Good, good. So we're, we're talking about how Christ did not stand on the sidelines, but he stepped into the crucible with us. And that really gives us a lot of hope in the future. But I wanted to start by asking you, has there ever been a time when you've been rescued or you've been a rescuer or maybe been a witness to a rescue that happened? So, uh, you know, we had a tree outside of our outside of our house in the front yard and it was kind of a small maple tree, small enough so that I could climb in it and everything. And, and uh, I was climbing in it one day and I was, and then I had, I had put my um, arms or my hands on, on two different branches and I was sort of propped up on it and I was going to let go to drop down, which is something I do all the time. It was like just a few feet. And uh, I let go and start and fell. And all of a sudden I just found myself hanging there in midair. And I was like, what's, what, what's happening? And my dad had recently cut a branch off that I think had died or something like that. And I oh, wow. was hanging on it now by my, by my elbow, like stabbed into my, a little bit into my armpit. And, and, uh, just, I'm just hanging there, you know, obviously freaking out because I, 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 I didn't know what to do. I didn't yeah. really know what had happened either. And, uh, my dad happened to be talking to a neighbor in the street. I was always out there all the time by myself. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but this time he happened to be talking to a neighbor like five feet away and then came and lifted me off. I don't know how I would have gotten off of it if, if, he, <laughs> if he hadn't been there, but yeah, so that's a time I was definitely oh, rescued. Wow. So, so did it, did it break your skin or catch you on your, oh yeah, my goodness. Yeah, I had to get stitches and yeah. Oh wow. So, that must yeah. have been painful too. From what I remember, I just remember vividly, like obviously screaming, Yeah. but, uh, I don't remember just how painful it was. I just remember that yeah. vivid moment of like hanging there and then I could, I could vividly remember my dad and my neighbor talking and them turning around and, and them seeing me. So yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. So I yeah. was rescued, being rescued. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I mean, the shock of the moment probably it clouds your memory of how yeah. painful it oh, actually was, I'm sure right? Like does. just, you're expecting to fall and all of a sudden you just <laughs> stopped in midair. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Wow. How about wow. you? So for me, um, I, I remember a time when I took my daughter to, a. Uh, a birthday party and there was swimming and um, the the owners of the house had done a great job of putting a fence around the swimming pool and you know so that kids would stay out when there weren't when there wasn't supervision but um, I was a little uncomfortable because my daughter didn't really know how to swim very well at that point and so I was standing inside that fence and just kind of monitoring her and I turned to chat with a, a parent um, and then like I don't know. I, I don't think a lot of time went by, maybe 15, 20 seconds. And I look back and she was gone. Like I couldn't find her. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and so I was, you know, frantically like scanning, where did she go? Did she leave? Yeah. And then I see her head pop up. Yeah. And so luckily she, she knew enough that, that she knew to continue to hop up for yeah. air if she, if she didn't, um, if she couldn't um, swim, swim to the surface. Yeah. And so she popped up. What had happened, I guess, was there was there was a drop off oh, to the deep end goodness. and she had stepped off and, without realizing and yeah. gone in the deep end and then she was hopping up. And so immediately I just jumped into the water and yeah. pulled her out and, and she was fine. Luckily yeah. she was fine. She, you know, of course a little rattled and a little yeah. bit scared. And I was I was pretty scared myself. <laughs> oh, yeah. But what yeah. was most scary for me was how quiet it was. Yeah. You know, there was no scream, there was no panic. All the kids around her were still playing, yeah. right? And so I could see how easily children could drown yeah. in a setting like that. And oh, so man. just so grateful that I was able to get her out and that yeah. she was fine. But yeah, <sighs> that was the time. I knew you were there. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I was glad to be a rescuer in that moment. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a rescuer as well. And um, what's incredible is that just like me diving into the water, well, maybe not just like that, but even worse than me diving into the water fully clothed, he steps into the crucible. Um, he steps out of heaven where everything is perfect and great and steps into the crucible of life here on earth. And so uh, the lesson goes through different stages of his life and talks about different ways that he faced the crucible. So I thought we would spend our time at, in different stages, including starting with his childhood, um, which is described in Luke chapter two. So yeah. I want to read from Luke chapter two, starting with verse seven, and then verses 22 through 24, kind of describing the, the state of his family um, 
when he was born. Luke chapter 2. Verse 7 reads, And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him, this is Mary, wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. So kind of making the point that they didn't have the resources and the uh, finances, they didn't have the family there in in Bethlehem to for them to stay over with them so that he was born in a in a stable and placed in a manger. And then verse 24 uh, 22 through 24 reads, And when the days of their purification according to the law of Moses were, were completed, they uh, brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And actually, if you look at that law in Leviticus, in the book of Leviticus, it actually mandates a lamb be offered unless you can't afford one and then you do turtle doves. So again, underlying how poor he was and how his family background was not wealthy or pampered. And so I guess my question is, why do you think, why do you think God chose to um, have his son? Why did Jesus choose to be born to a couple that didn't have those kind of resources? That wasn't, why not put him into context where he was wealthy or pampered or had status and influence like born to a priest's family or a Pharisee's family so that, so that he could have the kind of influence and make the kind of impact um, that we think we need, um, the authority that we need to make that kind of impact? I, I think a piece of it is that the the whole idea of the, the coming Messiah was this person who was going to be a, a leader that would lead the country into into uh, not only independence but also wealth and prosperity. Mm. And the uh, that, that's where you get those the statements by the disciples later. It's when Jesus yeah. says, oh, "It's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of of God," and they're like, "How? Who could ever enter?" Because there's this perspective of like wealth also equals. I, don't, I, don't, I actually don't know this for sure, but there seems to be some hints at it um, that wealth almost equals the favor of God uh, mm -hmm. or, or prosperity seems to, 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 to indicate that as well. Um, all sorts of reasons of why wealth was, was, was viewed so, so positively in that light. But then Jesus, on the other hand, goes, you know, it's, you know, it's hard for rich men to enter the kingdom of God. Yeah. Um, and for, for the rich young rulers, sell everything you have, give it to the poor and follow me. Mm -hmm. Because it seems like there's there's something about wealth that m maybe blinds us to our actual need and maybe even the needs of others. Not that that's wow. absolute, yeah. but that it tends to do that if we're not, if we're not intentional in the other direction. Yeah. And it would seem that Jesus in coming as as what is the experience of many that is overlooked by many, mm -hmm. that he is he is identifying himself not with those who have, but with those who don't have. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same thing. I did not come for the the, the healthy. I came for the sick. Mm -hmm. It's this. He seems to be identifying his experience with not those who have a maybe decent enough experience on earth, though everyone suffers, but with those who have the harder experiences. On wow. earth. I don't. I don't. And, and I. I don't know. That just seems to be. Yeah. Part of it. I don't know. So Jesus had this countercultural message, and so he not only spoke that message, but he actually lived it out himself. Instead yeah. of coming to a wealthy family, he comes to a poor family, <laughs> um, and in living out that, he he had he gives more weight to his message, uh, the countercultural message. I think so. I I think also, I always hesitate to to portray God as like planning unemotively, like. Mm. Like looking at the world, well, here's here would be plan like the best <laughs> best specific plans. I'll put all the chess pieces in place. Okay, perfect. Logically figured it all out. Mm -hmm. I, I think I look at it as God looking at this earth and saying like this is the the suffering of of those who have not is is exactly what was ho we were hoping to avoid through creation mm -hmm. and through the 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 idea of don't don't go that the direction of sin mm -hmm. because it creates all this un un or in inequality and, and brokenness. Mm -hmm. And so it seems that God is saying, I'm going to come and identify with those who are experiencing the worst of it mm -hmm. because this is the exact sort of brokenness that, that was always hoped to be avoided. And in that, it's what's, what's interesting is when you come as the poorest, even the richest can identify with the struggles mm -hmm. of humanity. However, 
if you come as a rich person, the poorest cannot identify with mm. with the that uh, in 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 the same way. So I don't I don't know. I don't yeah I don't want it to be logical, but as as much as it seems like God is just identifying with those who who are experiencing it the worst. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. So not so much like a cold tactician, mm-hmm. but yeah. more of yeah. trying to really identify with the poor. And you see that yeah. throughout, the, especially the book of Luke, mm-hmm. right? Where Jesus identifies with the outsiders, with the tax collectors, with yeah. the prostitutes, yeah. right? Yeah. Over and over again, these people that yeah. that society, good, good, honorable society had written off, mm-hmm. Jesus actually spends a lot of his time, the majority of your, uh, his time actually, yeah. with those people. Yeah. Yeah, and there's and if you think about the brokenness that would have been, especially for say someone who's who's in prostitution, like there's a lot of other brokenness that uh, that 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 is part of getting you to that space where you're doing that. Um, and then the tax collectors. What's very interesting about tax collectors is like he's hanging out with these people who they were the ones who seemed to be the ones oppressing the the, the people. And so Jesus is not does not seem to identify with those who we'd think he would he would identify with. Mm. He, yeah, it's I don't know. I don't even have a full. What's the right word? Thought out reason for all of that as much as just it's a very interesting thing for for for, for God to do. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that actually kind of reminds me of a of a story I heard about Henry Nowen. Um he he is um a priest who was a very famous speaker and writer, and he had a friend um in in a mental hospital who was a patient in a, in a mental hospital and wanted to go visit him but when the the staff of that hospital found out that Henry Nowen was going to show up there they wanted to throw a banquet for him they wanted all the doctors to come and and to sit with him and learn from him and he agreed to do that as long as his his um, patient friend could be with him and when he gets there and he tries to have the patient go in. Uh, the 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 leader of that clinic says, "No, no, no. Patients are not allowed in the mm-hmm. doctor's cafeteria." Mm-hmm. And Henry says, "Well, if he's not allowed in there, then I won't be in there yeah. either." And they quickly make an exception for him. And he just describes how that experience and the interactions between the patient and, and the do- the patient and that doctor, the doctors there, actually opened their eyes because. Um, you know, the, the patients started to do some random things, mm-hmm. but in, in, in doing it, they really expressed the joy of God. And mm-hmm. he, Henry points to that, that God speaks sometimes from the most unexpected places, yeah. right? And we see that with, with Jesus, that mm-hmm. he gives such dignity um, to those that society has kind of written off and said, you're not really worth spending time with, you're not really worth listening to. Mm-hmm. Um, Jesus gives those people dignity. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems like there's also a call to identify ourselves with that, even if we're not in those positions. That yeah. Instead of being the people who's, oh, thank God I'm not in those in that space, it's it's almost like a an encouragement to be the type of people that can identify with or would go to identify with those with those people. It's it's not only that Jesus enters the crucible, he calls other people who may not be in the same crucible as these others mm. that have become others by by the rest of society. It's a call to, 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 it's, it's what Pastor Randy has said several times. I think he got, I don't recall where he got it from, but hot Christian hospitality is making the outsider an insider. Mm. It's that whole idea that Jesus seems to do with his life instead of just sort of coming to this earth separate from it all. Because I don't think we could identify with a God that we couldn't identify in the way that we do now with a God who is fully separate from our suffering. I don't, I don't think. Wow. Um, it's what we see in, in Hebrews. It's one of my favorite verses. It's, in fact, I think the thing that really kick-started my personal relationship with God, even though I'd grown up Adventist, when I was about 16, it was the, this is a verse, Hebrews 4.15 says that we have a God who can identify with our weaknesses. Paul actually, or whoever wrote Hebrews, uses the double negative. We have a God who, we do not have a God who cannot mm-hmm. um, identify with our weaknesses, for he was tempted in every way as we are, and he didn't sin. And then there's the invitation on the back side of that, which is to therefore let us uh, come before the throne of grace boldly. And that's the power of it is that we have a God who can sympathize. And that was the thing that shifted my perspective on, mm. on God. He wasn't this almost Superman that came to earth, bullets bounced off of him, yeah. was never tempted by, uh, by anger, by lust, by whatever it was that 
um, or, or I guess inappropriate anger. Um, he was never tempted. He was, it wasn't like he was never tempted into those things. Those were pulls and, and mm. those drew, those felt like draws to him, I'm sure. It's just the difference between him and us is that he did not give into those things and become those things. Yeah. And what it spoke to me was that this was a God who got what it was like for me to be a 16 year old mm. male. He was a God who got what it was like to be in this space in life and he wasn't unacquainted with it with the suffering, with the difficulty, with the, 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 the pulls, different directions in life. And that was the thing that shifted me mm. from being like, oh yeah, God's something up there to this God is, he actually knows me. Yeah. Knows what it's cares. like. Yeah. 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 That's, that's powerful that you say that, that God is willing to not only s- stand up there and say that I want to pull you up to me. Mm-hmm. He's also saying, I'm willing to step into mm-hmm. that muck and be with you. And he's actually experienced that himself so that he can identify with, with the challenges we face. Yeah. And then you said something really powerful. You, you said that he calls us into the crucible as well. Mm-hmm. So that crucibles that may not be our own for us to step into that. Mm-hmm. So are you saying it is, is the responsibility of those who are not in the crucible to step into the crucibles with other people that and and so that they can we can also identify with with them and then help bring them in like Christ did for us. I would say so. I mean, just based off of what, what Jesus says, He says, "You'll know my disciples by how you love." Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I found very intense about love is that that you have to be able to identify with somebody else's difficulties to truly be able to love them. Yeah. It's always easy to love somebody's, every, all the good stuff mm-hmm. about somebody. It's really difficult. It becomes more difficult yes. as soon as you're faced with the imperfections, with mm-hmm. the, the um, yeah, which is all the imperfections of somebody else or their circumstance. And it would seem to me that for those of us who say we're called to love and then, oh yeah, we love everybody. But many of us are not stepping into the crucibles of other people. And so then it's very difficult to understand or even be able to really say that we love them because there is so little identification with what they might actually be going with, mm-hmm. going through. So it's easy to say, I love you from afar, and then also to condemn behavior from afar. It's a lot, it's a lot easier to actually say, I love you when I'm, it's easier to say it, harder to live it out when I'm, when I'm with somebody in their, in their, in their difficulty in the crucible moments of their life. So I, it seems to me that Jesus is calling us into that. And if, I don't think we can step into every crucible thing, like every situation, every yeah. societal discussion now, yeah. we can't, we just can't, we're humans. However, it seems like, man, at least one, at <laughs> least somebody, at least one person mm. um, that's outside of our, our, maybe our economic sphere, out of our, out of our um, circle of friends, out of the people we might normally hang out with, it seems like we have to be to be able to identify with at least somebody yeah. that's not from those spaces. Yeah, I don't know. Those I mean, are just thoughts. <laughs> what you're describing talk seems a lot like empathy, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, is um, being with someone. It's not just um, sympathizing, where mm-hmm. we're just um, mentally um, emoting certain emotions, but that we're actually identifying with the person yeah. sitting alongside them in the mm-hmm. curve of life that empathy. And you, you, you use the word that the Christian practice of hospitality, mm-hmm. you talked about the Christian practice of hospitality as being more than actually, you know, a lot of times we think of hospitality as having potluck, mm-hmm. you know, and yeah. serving a meal, which is a powerful part oh, of yeah. hospitality. Sure. I mean, one that I've benefited from yeah. many times yeah. and that I love, <laughs> right? But potluck really, or, or those me- fellowship meals really just set up a context where hospitality can happen, yeah. right? Like I've been to some um, potlucks or um, fellowship lunches where nobody said hi to me as a guest, <laughs> right? They had the food and they gave me food, which yeah. was very nice, uh-huh. but nobody sat next to me, yeah. nobody talked to me. I don't know if that was the most hospitable environment. Yeah. Um, it seems like what you're saying is hospitality has at, a heart, at the heart of it a certain posture, right? A posture that says, I'm not gonna wait until you adapt to me. Mm-hmm. I will adapt to you, yeah. right? That I will step into those spaces. Not saying that I need to become like the people who are in the crucible, but saying that I, I, I have to be willing to step into that crucible and identify with them enough so that when I speak words, they can I speak them in a word that a way that they can be understood mm-hmm. and that I've shown that I've cared and yeah. that, that I'm not waiting until somebody becomes like me in order for them to be accepted. 
Yeah, because when when that is the when that is the the primary function, when, when we say first you you have to sort of enter into my world before I will relate with you, like that is that is literally the opposite of what of what God has done for us. And what I think is very interesting too is is <laughs> that you would you would think, and I, I believe this, that God is God. He he absolutely could understand fully the experience of anybody mm. if he had never come. Mm. But it seems like he comes not for his own understanding, but for us. Mm. And that even like me logically knowing that this God that is formless and and obviously powerful, it, it seems to be his fingerprints are all over creation and all over our lives, but yet he's formless and, and unknowable to a certain degree. That even if I logically know he knows all of my 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 circumstances and and what it's like to to be a, in this space in this world that it just doesn't have the same comfort mm -hmm. as knowing that like he walked here too mm -hmm. i mean to the simplistic version of he knows what it's like to have a bunch of dust under his feet and his sandals and it's really annoying and uncomfortable and he has to stop take his sandals off like yeah. something as humanizing as that mm. puts the rest of it in context yeah. that then that same god who had that that had the dust be annoying is the same God that experienced utter rejection and the pain of knowing people that he would love would would just never get it. Like that's a huge thing that I I, I can't imagine that pain and I can't imagine the suffering of of feeling like he was the other mm -hmm. when all these other people had yeah. decided this is what our group is. And it goes right back to I just imagine at that potluck, like this God who or Jesus who this man, but God who steps in and comes comes into this room and goes to hang out with all of the people that we we're all kind of like, I'm glad they're at that table <laughs> while the rest of us hang out. Yeah. And that would be, that would, and I get why people hated him. Yeah. Because that's weird. Yeah. And it's it's. It also I think hits at the at, the, at this core thing that we understand in ourselves. That's just like, I really know that I'm called to that, but I'm not doing it. And then somebody else is doing it, and I hate that because it points to my own. Weaknesses. So I get why he was hated too. Yeah. But I'm so grateful that he still stepped in. I don't know. Yeah, yeah there is sort of an expectation that God will be like me, yeah. right? That God will like the people that I like. Yeah. He'll identify with the people that I identify. That yeah. there is this perspective that, oh, Jesus is like me. And I, I, you know, we get that because we, yeah. we, all, we even want our celebrities or people that we respect whenever we find any kind of connection with them, like, oh, their birthday is on the same day that mine is, or, or something, something that has nothing to do, no bearing on our yeah. life. It's something that, that um, resonates with us, oh, yeah, right? Sure. Because as you were pointing out, we are physical beings and there's some realism that comes for yeah. something that is tangible and yeah. physical. Like I never got that until I went to Israel for myself. Mm -hmm. And I never understood why people took pilgrimages, mm -hmm. why people, you know, um, had relics and mm -hmm. things like that until I got there and I stood on a spot in Capernaum where um, they talked about Jesus, pro this is the path that Jesus most likely took to get to Peter's mm -hmm. mother's house. And it just hit me, wow, Jesus stood <laughs> right, right here. here. And there was just something powerful and moving yeah. about that, just something more real mm -hmm. about that experience. It wasn't just the knowledge of, oh, this is what it looked like, and so the Bible became more alive. It was also the fact that Jesus was right there. Mm -hmm. And it, for some reason, made me feel closer to him. Mm -hmm. So I get that wanting that, that connection with Jesus, but we also have to understand that Jesus not only identifies with us, mm -hmm. that he identifies with everyone, right? Which is the harder leap for us yeah. to make. Well, because that's one of the things about our friends, like our friends, to, to a certain degree, naturally have to be exclusive to a certain point. Mm -hmm. Like if you're friends with everybody, you're not really friends with anybody mm -hmm. because you, you never really have, like I, I was, I had a moment with a friend recently where we were at a party and then he and I were sitting down separate from everybody else and talking. Mm -hmm. And that was a really special moment for me because there needs to be some sort of exclusivity for there to be more connection. Yeah. The, 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 the really annoying part about Jesus is that if he was there, he would have that moment with me. But then if there was a person who was, harsh to me, not nice to me, or somebody I was harsh to and was not nice to you mm -hmm. and, and just didn't relate with, whatever it was, 
that he would also go and sit down with them and have that same conversation and <laughs> love them. And there's something frustrating about that, I think, yeah. which is just like, why can't, why can't I be the center of the universe? Mm. And why can't everything kind of revol revolve around what I, what, what you're saying, what I prefer, what I like, the people I like, the people I identify with. Yeah. And there's just something that he, him coming the way that he did, it sort of alienates everybody to a, to a small degree where all of us are a bit like, oh, but that's not exactly like my situation, <laughs> but that's just like somebody else's that I don't identify with. Yeah. And it's a powerful, I don't know, like it's just, it's, it's challenging at the same time. And I know we can't be all things to everybody. Um, God can only be God and we can't, we are limited, but it is a call to stretch, it seems like, mm -hmm. outside, of, outside of our comfort zones as Jesus came and was way outside of anybody's box. <laughs> like, I don't know. He definitely broke open all the boxes that people had of who he was. Yeah, and, and that kind of empathy and breaking open the boxes, um, I think the, the point that le the lesson makes is that that took sacrifice, mm -hmm. right? It took sacrifice for Jesus to be born um, in a manger, to be laid in a manger after his birth, to be born to a poor family, um, to be ridiculed and despised and rejected and attacked by, by the leaders and the religious establishment of that time, to be misunderstood by the people. Um, all of that took sacrifice. And do you think it takes that kind of sacrifice for us now if we're also going to follow in Jesus' footsteps? Does that mean that we're also going to encounter those kinds of challenges because we're also breaking open boxes and not meeting people's expectations as well? I, I think there's I think there's two things. To answer your question specifically, mm -hmm. I think, yeah, it, it, like, it's going to take sacrifice because it means that you're going to be misunderstood. Um, that's one of the things I've actually found kind of funny in the in the recent years of being a pastor. Um, the more I've spoken with people that are would be traditionally outside of out of Christian communities, that I mean, to to be honest, the more I know them, the harder it is to to, to ostracize and to to put them outside of the Christian community, mm -hmm. especially people who say they love Jesus and they just they're not living lives that are traditionally within the box. Mm. And it's it's just a it's a really tough thing because the more you identify with those people, I imagine it would have it would have been even more pronounced with Jesus and and prostitutes and tax collectors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like them? Like what are you really what Jesus? are you doing? <laughs> because that's that's not what a good Jew does. Mm -hmm. That's not what a good Seventh day Adventist does. That's not what mm -hmm. a that's that's the idea. And so to identify yourself with people who are who are in suffering is, is to identify yourself with people who are not with necessarily always within the traditional bounds of, of our understanding for what, what is acceptable. And that's a, that's a difficult thing. Yeah. Like people can always misunderstand your, your intentions. They can think that well, by identifying with these people, you are also agreeing with everything. Mm -hmm. um, they can believe that by associating with those people, you're going to become like that, mm -hmm. and all. It's just like it's there's a lot of that, but and so it takes a sacrifice of of, of almost your ego, yeah. of saying, okay, Lord, I understand that others will will misunderstand, but you have called me to love, and so I will. Mm -hmm. And your own family, your, your your church members, a lot of people may ostracize you for that, but then on the other hand, too, I think it's like Jesus is suffering here on this earth too. Seem to be a bit not just based on like being ostracized, but also the difficulties of then being in those situations. I can just imagine him sitting in a conversation with somebody and hearing, let's say this, this you know, tax collectors and sinners. So there's these people who are living outside the bounds of, of, of Judaism potentially. And they're talking about like what they did the night before or the <laughs> week before. And I can just imagine like the, the inner turmoil of, I love this person mm. and I'm so sad that they're hurting themselves in this way. And I'm so sad that this is, they're also maybe even bringing other people into it. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not just the ostracization of like the yeah. religious people. It's also the, like, I hurt for you yeah. and I wish that things were different. So there's also that difficulty, which requires, mm -hmm. I don't know, sacrifice a heart for people that's going to hurt no matter what. I don't know. It's yeah. just, those are just tough situations. Yeah. 
I, I remember somebody <laughs> describing the prophets this way. People um, have asked, why do the prophets always seem so angry, right? <laughs> why are they always so yeah. angry and kind of, you know, ornery, or, ornery and yeah. all of that? Yeah. And um, he said, um, prophets are like people born with perfect pitch in an off pitch world, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And I've always thought of it as a blessing yeah. if somebody was born with perfect pitch, but talking to my friend who has perfect pitch, <laughs> she says that it's also a struggle yeah. because, you know, for me, if if a piano is relatively tuned to itself, Sounds great. it's fine, yeah. right? But for someone who has perfect pitch, if it's not tuned to the actual pitch, yeah. it is, it's, it's yeah. like grating on them. Yeah. And, you know, we know that the majority of instruments in this world are not in perfect tune, yeah. right? And so how bothersome, that, how grating that must be to your soul. Yeah. And the prophets are like that. And how much more Jesus oh, like yeah. that, right? Yeah. Living in a world that is sinful and broken. And he's here he is like someone who is perfect and someone who is, you know, aligned perfectly to God. Mm -hmm. And how grating that must have been to live in that kind of world, that kind of sacrifice. Yeah, like the, the word that's translated as perfect, I believe, is teleos. It's like, mm -hmm. uh, it means like maturity, yeah. to, to grow to maturity. I've always struggled with that that translation of be perfect as my father in heaven. It's like, it's because perfection sounds like a, you reach the state of, of nothing is ever, uh, nothing ever bothers you. Yeah. But it, maturity seems like a, a, a really helpful term. And I just, I know for myself, if I, if I were to hang out with, 16, 17, well, no, 14 to 16 year old me. Oh man, like <laughs> I would be so bothered by myself. And I, I just think, I think of it in that way with Jesus of, yeah. of less so like looking down upon people, but just mm -hmm. like, I, like in the situations I've been in where I'm, I'm with somebody and I'm like, I just, this is not even really like personal opinion. This is like, this is psychological studies and all this stuff. What you're doing is not good for you. Yeah. And it's just like, it hurts. Yeah. And I, I don't, I don't know how he made it through. <laughs> I don't know how Jesus made it through all of this as he just watched people who were suffering, but also like one, there's, it's one thing to suffer. It's also another thing to go through that suffering and it caused more suffering to yourself mm -hmm. because you're, you're treating it poorly. Mm -hmm. So for instance, uh, it's one thing for somebody to pass away and you to suffer because you miss them. But it's a whole nother thing to also then be in denial and for mm -hmm. the, for like decades, like that just only compounds the suffering. Mm -hmm. And I just imagine him looking at people and just like, you're just compounding your own suffering. That's, yeah. that's gotta be painful. But then at the same time, loving them so deeply. And that's one thing that I would say that we don't, we don't think too much about when we think about the suffering of God and him coming in, into the crucible where it's like, he was not afraid to vulnerably love people mm -hmm in spite of the pain that that would still cause him. That's, that's, a, that's a shocking thing. I think we put up walls and we, 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 we wall ourselves off from, from certain aspects of relationship or from, 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 from certain people because of the pain that it might cause to us. Yeah. But he doesn't do that. He walks right into those circumstances with people yeah. that on the one hand would judge and hate him. And on the other hand, people who would constantly disappoint uh, the, the, the potential vision for what creation ought to be and really on both sides, the same thing. But like, how do you walk in that space mm -hmm. and still love everybody and not become cynical yeah. and walled off and just like, whatever, nobody gets it. Like, yeah. I, I don't know how you walk through the through life like that. Yeah. Well, oh, that is such a powerful point that you're making that love, if we're truly going to love people, we have to be vulnerable enough mm -hmm. to suffer. Yeah. That there's going to be a potential for pain and for hurt, right? Because loving loving people who are broken just like we're broken mm -hmm. will often cause pain yeah. right um john ortberg um um in his book um i actually don't remember the title but he talks about porcupines and how porcupines um have this dilemma of having to wanting to be with other porcupines but never <laughs> being able to be close enough because they continue to poke each other yeah. right and he uses that as, as an example of us as humans, mm -hmm. right? That we are like porcupines. All of us have brokenness. We have sharp edges. Mm -hmm. Like if we, you know, someone said, there are always people who um, will in your life who will be EGR. They'll have extra grace required, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. And if you can't think of the person, it might be it's probably, <laughs> <laughs> right? 
<laughs> yeah, so we all have those edges. Yeah. And so whenever we brush up against somebody else and we get close, the closer we get to someone, the yeah. more we see those edges and the more we experience that yeah. kind of pain. And yet the dilemma is we are built to love, we're built to care, and we can't unless we're willing to expose ourselves to yeah. the possibility of, of pain. And yeah. that just seems to be such a, for the, for people who are in that space of like, I'm cutting myself off from people or parts of relationships because it, it hurts and I don't want to go back there. It's it's just crazy to, to, to think about Jesus walking through life and the relatability. Like you could sit down with Jesus over, over, uh, over a meal and just be like, isn't it so frustrating mm -hmm. to, to feel like, okay, I want to open myself up to this person and yet I feel like they're going to hurt me. So I close it off or they're going to say something that hits something deep inside of me. And so I just close that off and, and Jesus goes, yeah, like it's tough. It's tough mm -hmm. to walk through that. I've walked through similar stuff and, and, and just it's, it's to think that we could have a conversation with Jesus that was like, he's like, yeah, I get it. <laughs> I've been there. It's, it's, it stinks. Um, that's a, that's a powerful thing because it, I think it actually, it, it's, it's when you have somebody else to identify who, who identifies with a similar situation, it often gives you strength to be able to face that, that thing mm -hmm. because they've also faced it too. And now you're not alone in facing it. Someone else has done it too. And I just think of that, like we often put it in that space of like, well, Jesus was rejected and, and hated. And I'm like, I don't have so much of that experience. I really <laughs> don't, but I do have that experience of, of walking through life and, and, uh, and wanting to love people, but cutting myself off from because of how I might be hurt. Mm -hmm. And Jesus had, had the same opportunity, but didn't do it, but knows what it feels like to want to, I think, yeah. based off of what Hebrews says. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, that's a powerful thought, so. Yeah, it's true. And we're not talking about, you know, the um, having no boundaries, right? No, because yeah, yeah. Yeah, there, are, there are times that we have to put appropriate boundaries and separate us from people who are taking advantage or um, are abusing, right? In those kind of spaces, it's very appropriate to put up boundaries. And, and we even, see, yeah, even right. Jesus did it. Yeah, I yeah. was going to say, like, that's, he, he relates to that too. Yeah. yeah. So there are times that, yeah, Jesus stepped in and he said, no, that this is enough. You're yeah. not going to go any further. And so um, that's not what we're talking about. But we are saying that all love opens us up to yeah. the possibility of being hurt, yeah. right? It requires that kind of vulnerability, especially because we are all broken people. Yeah. And um, and yet, like you pointed out, Christ does that and he steps into those spaces. And even though he is so much more sensitive to sin than we ever would be, he is still able to have such compassion, yeah. so much love and caring for people and not turn cynical like you yeah. pointed out. And that's incredible. <laughs> and then, I, then I even think of of the whole, I mean, the very the very you know sort of on the side thing that he died for us. <laughs> that's that's a sarcasm, but but I mean he he, he comes and and it's to the point of death. That mm. It's not just it's not just yeah. I'll come and yeah it's sort of a tough existence and you know I know that you've suffered and you know that so I'll, I'll experience some of that. But that he identifies with it all the way to the end of it, mm. which is which is a a it's a brutal thing really when we look at it, but it's also one of the things that is comfort and hope to us yeah. is that we are, we, we have, we've have not gone through this alone, but, but not, not just to this point all the way, like Jesus has experienced. If, if you have somebody on uh, that you love, that's on their deathbed, you know, like Jesus experienced that in this life with, with his friend Lazarus and other people, but then even beyond that, he himself was there too and, mm -hmm. and knows the fear the terror, the terror that comes with that, mm -hmm. the questions, the feeling like, does God actually care? Like, is he, yeah. is he even close? Like all of that suffering that isn't just suffering that's physical, but the suffering internally and, and some of our deepest, darkest fears, he felt some of those things too. And it didn't keep him from doing yeah. what he, what he ultimately did, but, but it's still, I, I am certain he felt it or else he wouldn't have been in the garden saying, God, please, yeah. father, please. If there's any other way, like I, he had to have felt those things too. Yeah. 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 You know, and I, although I hate that Jesus had to go through that, that experience of yeah. Gethsemane and the crucifixion, what, what I find is as we get closer to the crucifixion, we are given a little bit more of a glimpse of the humanity of Christ and his own personal struggles mm -hmm. with the suffering and all that. Before then, as he's doing ministry, he's 
not aloof because he has so much compassion, but we don't really get an insight on how these events are affecting him yeah. internally. But when we get to the garden, all yeah. of a sudden that window is opened up and yeah. you get a glimpse at that. And I think that's so powerful, like you said, that we have a God who identifies with us in that he went through that himself, that, that feeling of separation and abandonment from God, not knowing what the next step will be, fear about the future. So I want to read, um, as, we, as we wrap up today, I, I want to read that passage from Mark chapter 14, verses 32 through 42. And I guess this is, this is what we'll, we'll, we'll end today. They came to a place named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here until I have prayed. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be very distressed and troubled. Again, already you, you see that he is not, this is not just another um, late night prayer session that he's having. Yeah. He's, he's struggling here. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch. And went a little beyond them and fell to the ground and began to pray that if possible, the hour might pass him by, like, like you had talked about. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Mm -hmm. And he came and he found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not come into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came a third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. And so that window that we get into the internal struggle yeah. and fear and anxiety and and feeling of abandonment mm -hmm. that Jesus has. Yeah. Yeah, and, and what's what's kind of crazy about the whole rest of this is that like Jesus seems to be able to identify with all sorts of injustice in, in, the, in the whole thing. Because I mean, not only do his friends not support him in his time of need. I remember there was a, a period of time where there was a lot going on with our family and some of our friends didn't know what to, some of our family friends didn't know what to do mm. with everything that was going on. My parents were splitting up and there was a lot going on. And so they just kind of like took a full step back mm. from even my mom and who was, who was not the, not the perpetrator of this thing. And she felt abandoned through, mm. through all of that. And so I, I, I can't even understand where they're coming from. Mm. The friends are, but that feeling for the person going through it, like that's kind of, that just hurts. It's yeah. like, it's painful. But then you, you keep going and you have like the actual person, Judas, who betrays Jesus. And maybe, maybe somebody has that person in their life. But then you go even farther. Now there's all of these religious leaders who are supposed to be the ones who know God best, mm. but they're the ones who are the ones just sort of perpetrating some of the worst injustice in that. And some of some some people I know have incredible stories of hurt from church, from church pain, you know, church church hurt is what is what we call it. Um, and then you even have like people specifically, it says for there was many who bore false witness against him, mm -hmm. but their testimony didn't agree. So there's little people p taking money yeah. in order to get him falsely accused of things, mm -hmm. but they couldn't even get their story straight. And yet there was this like wave that was happening where it, it didn't matter that their stories didn't agree. It was, mm -hmm. Jesus was still going to, like the injustice of that must yeah. have been, I've experienced some injustice in my life and it's maddening because yeah. you can't do anything about mm -hmm. it and it's so not mm -hmm. fair. But then you get down to even Jesus who he has somebody who's like, I will always be with you, Peter. You know, I will always fight for you. Right. And then even him when he's confronted by a, a, a like a, a young girl, it's like, oh, no, no, I don't know Jesus. <laughs> and you just imagine that pain, and then yeah. you get to, like, Rome, who is supposed to stand for justice. Yeah. And even in that, they say, ah, this isn't beneficial to us, so we'll let it happen. It's not beneficial for us to stop it, mm -hmm. so we'll let it happen. And, and there's even more stories. But it's like all of that, like the deepest injustices of mm -hmm. the world, Jesus feels, yeah. as many people have felt. But he seems to feel it from all of the quarters at once. And it's shocking that, again, he could go through this and still willingly stay in that. Again, because, I mean, you have the whole, he could call 10,000 angels, mm -hmm. but he doesn't. And he doesn't. that's it's wild that he would willingly step into that space and allow us to do what we do. And for any of us who have been on the receiving end of what the world does and what we also might do to others, I just don't understand how he 
how he stayed. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. So he felt abandoned by God. Yeah. He felt abandoned by his friends. Yeah. His, actually, his friends do abandon him. Literally, literally yeah. abandoned him. <laughs> and, and then he, he's here to save the world, yeah. literally save the world. Like yeah. other times we, we say those, that phrase and it's, yeah. it's an exaggeration. Yeah. But Jesus is literally here to save the world and yet he's misunderstood. Yeah. He's being punished. He's being attacked yeah. for the good thing yeah. that he's doing. Oh, so it's yeah. it's not just the fact that he's being crucified. Your, yeah. your point seems to be that he's the reason why he's being crucified is for doing something that he didn't actually do. Yeah. And he's he's actually trying to do a good thing. And yeah. they're instead misunderstanding and attacking him. And, and then again, to go back to injustice, like injustice is one of the hardest things in this world to, to deal with because there's it, it, no rhyme or reason to it. It shouldn't be that way, yeah. but yet it, 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 it is that way. Yeah. And Jesus, he knows stepping into this world, if I come to this world and I am the way that I am mm. and I remain true to myself, I mean, he's, he's God, it will inevitably come into conflict with this world. Mm. And that's one of the hardest parts for us is it, it even comes to that point of like, do I stay true do do I continue to follow God down paths that are difficult? Mm. Because that will inevitably cause conflict with, with the way that all of the world is. And I have contributed to that with my own brokenness. But inevitably it will come into conflict. And then at that point, do you continue to follow or do you decide to go back into your own way? Yeah. And that's such a, like, that battle, he must have come to that point mm. so many times. Yeah. And yet stayed stayed true. And And that is a powerful thing. I know, I know we won't be perfect in that way, but like it is a, it is a call to something that's difficult mm -hmm. that he's, he's not saying like, I'm calling you into this. It's going to be great. Yeah. He's like, no, I know it's difficult. I know it's suffering. He literally says it to his disciples. There's so much suffering in front of you, <laughs> but I have overcome the world. Wow. And that's a powerful, that's a powerful dichotomy. Yeah. Yeah. The fact that Jesus has already stepped into those spaces of injustice. Yeah. He's experienced some of the worst that humanity has to throw at him. He's been misunderstood, misaligned. He's been, um, he's been attacked both but verbally and physically and emotionally. Uh -huh. And yet he, he came through that and he says, I'll get you through as well. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, so powerful. <laughs> it's wild. Yep. Yeah, just, and, and like you said, injustice is so maddening. I love how yeah. you said that. It's maddening because it feels like it, it, it cramps on our pride. It, yeah. it, it makes us feel like you're powerless. Yeah, you're powerless. Yeah. And yet Jesus went through that. Yeah. And he says, it may not be over mm -hmm. in this world, yeah. but I do have a plan and a future for yeah. you. And I love, I love how Paul describes that connection with God, that word, those words of encouragement in Romans chapter eight, yeah. right? where he says um, in verse 26, in the same way, the spirit also helps our weaknesses, right? Um, verse 18, for I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be com compared with the glory that is revealed to us, yeah. right? He says, I know we're going to suffer. I know it's going to be painful, but that does not compare to the glory that is revealed to us. And then in verse, um, right at the end, verse 38, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is, is in Christ Jesus mm -hmm. our Lord. And that ultimately is our hope, yeah. right? That no matter what we're going through right now, and there are some of you I know that are going through so much, yeah. so much more than we can even imagine, that Jesse and I can even imagine going through. And yet the word of word of encouragement from Christ, who also went through so much, is that nothing will separate you from his love. Yeah. And I hope that will be the hope that carries us through. Absolutely. Yeah. Jesse, will you pray for us as yeah. well? Lord, we thank you that you have walked into this space uh, of suffering with us, that you didn't just create this world and step back and say, good luck, that you, be, you were intimately involved not just in its creation, but in its in its continuation. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, Lord, we can walk through today, not with the promise that it will be devoid of suffering, because it will continue to, to have suffering. This is a broken world, and we will continue to feel that pain. However, we walk through this with the, with the promise that you, the one who has experienced all of this and overcome it, is walking with us. Mm -hmm. And so we trust in you, Lord. 
we, we pray for anyone who's experiencing these incredibly difficult circumstances right now, that they would feel your presence and your peace through it, to know that they can still walk through this with you in your name. Amen. Amen. So friends, no matter what you're going through right now, know that our incarnate God, our empathetic God, our hospitable God is walking alongside you. Have a wonderful Sabbath. Sheila Hodgkin here with Ganem. Everyone knows Ganem. How are you, Ganem? Everyone knows Sheila. <laughs> I am blessed and I trust you as well. I am too. We're, we're blessed. And I know you're blessed out there too. And um, our verse of the day, can I start with that? Please. But the Lord watches over those who fear him, those who rely on his unfailing love. Psalms 33, 18. Hmm. That's really beautiful and comforting, isn't it? It really is because um, if if we pray, we know that he listens and he hears us. And if we love him and fear him, we know he's watching over us. So. And if we're under his watch, why should we fear anything? Although we're humans mm -hmm. and we do experience fear and insecurities uh, and stress. But at the end of the day, if we keep reminding ourselves who is our father, and then we should have nothing to worry about. That's right. Nothing to worry about when we have God as our Father. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for choosing that verse. Well, I love that verse. That's been a, been a stronghold for me. So, love that. Well, we have four sponsors. We do. We have the Bliss family from Georgia, the Jacob family from Pennsylvania, the Gilbert family from Alabama, and the Marshall family from Tennessee. God mm. bless you, and we thank you so much for sponsoring this hour we have sponsors every 24-7, and um, but we specifically are thanking these sponsors for this hour, so thank you very much. Yeah, and you said, you, you're absolutely right. It's miraculous. It is amazing, heartwarming. Every half hour throughout a 24-hour cycle, we have sponsors. Now, they don't choose the half hour or hour. It is our computer system. Just kind of select the Sabbath you know, those who happen to be read on the Sabbath life hours. Uh, so it just kind of randomly keeps picking up the, the names. But every time you watch LLBN, you have to remember the amazing faith by all those names who appear on the screen. What a faith in God's work that they're putting their trust in a ministry from distance mm -hmm. to help us go in the airways and get back on the grounds and every city around the world. That's right. We have wonderful prayer partners and wonderful viewers like you that support this ministry. We can't do it without you. So Amen. God bless you. So big thank you. And absolutely, I second that over and over again. God bless you for your support. You are our congregation. You are the family of this ministry that keeps going for 27 years now, Sheila. 27, just as old as I am. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't doubt that. But, but for those of us who've been in it from day one till now, it has just been a phenomenal journey seeing not what we did, but what God allowed us to do and what God empowered us to do. A testimony for all believers, if you believe in him and put your faith in him, whether in personal life, ministry, or business, he will get you through all troubles. He will get you through everything and help you to cross and accomplish many milestones. Amen. Amen. That's right. Well, we had a wonderful Christian Connections. And if you missed it, this last Tuesday live, you get to watch it one more time. Right, Adam? That's right. I'm actually looking forward to watch I this one watch again. I want to watch it again. We had the wonderful Dr. Anthony Hilliard, and he talked about... Um, eating to live and living to eat, you know, uh, which one's better? You'll have to tune in and, and find out. I sincerely say this is one you don't want to miss because 
you don't hear these topics, these discussions coming from scientific people. You go on the internet, YouTube, Google, whatever, and you get hodgepodge of variety of information and answers so vary from answer to answer for on the same topic that you search. But here it's presented scientifically. And if you see all the credentials that Dr. Hilliard has, you will trust what he is telling us. So tune in for yes. the replay. It, it is outstanding. And I love how s s the science and the spirituality, the trust in God. That's right. Goes together. So don't miss it. And, and that's one of the music you had too. And that's an excellent point you raised about the mixture. You know, and he puts it so simple for all of us to understand. He, you know, as, as, as advanced he is scientifically, he brought it in, into very, very average language for all of for us to understand. For every language, for me, for people well, for like me. me. So <laughs> if I can understand it, you will too. So. All right, what we got next? Well, we also have um, the angel's message. There's a two hour special coming up. You want to talk That's about that, That's correct, Gavin? that's correct. So this coming Tuesday, mark your calendar. It's a very, very special program. Uh, we're trying to bring you one each month to our special, a mixture of music, discussion, sermons, and variety of topics. Uh, the Three Angels Message are a part, the Three Angels Message are a part of the prophecy of Revelation 13 through 14 that contrasts true and false worship and the battle between Jesus and Satan. These messages are directly from Jesus to his people. They are an invitation to each individual and an end time imperative. So uh, it is deep. Uh, most Adventists are familiar with the three angels message, but you know, it doesn't hurt to always hear it from another teacher's perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's going to be, that message is going to be broken down into four segments uh, uh, to be presented by Dr. Uh, uh, Roger Schwelt. So. Oh, awesome. I love him too. And he's another wonderful doctor that puts he, it together for us. He is indeed. Succinctly. So, well, especially being a scientific person, he knows how to assemble the blocks in a way mm -hmm. that it all connects. And he had his st studies in theology himself. So, so we thank God for this opportunity. So Tuesday, 6 p.m., live Pacific time here on His Word channel. And we also have uh, the October SLS schedule. And Ganem, do you have that schedule down, Pac? Mm -hmm. So make sure to go to LLBN.TV, the same website. We have all our resources there for you. Uh, click on schedules on the top of the screen, as you see on the screen, uh, and have a pull down win uh, window. Or you can click on the channel name, SLS, and that will get you directly to that channel page. And in there, you'll be able to click on schedule and see the schedule. Uh, there are lots of new programs airing on that channel. Uh, you definitely want to uh, uh, watch Dr. Hilliard. Hilliard. He has his own series now, uh, premiering October 2nd on Smart Lifestyle TV. We call it SLS, uh, and as well as uh, another series by Dr. Roger Schwelt uh, on health as well among many other health programs. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, our health channel, it is just growing left and right in all directions worldwide and heavily in America and Canada because of its uh, 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 scientific-based health teaching. And again, it's not the hodgepodge, you know, confusion of information as you find on YouTube or Google or yes, other places. Yes. That's great, that's so, wonderful. I can't wait. You have to tune in and make sure to check your schedule. And Ganon, we also, want to tell you we are just so grateful for the growth of this ministry for 27 years it has just grown exponentially and um, that's due to god we take no credit but just from god through all of you folks and um, we want to thank the board and the senior leadership anything to add with that yes i, I do want to say something about the, the our, our board members are the most incredible gentle-hearted yet brilliant business people who've done all kind of business in their career, throughout their careers, and they're loving and humble to be part of our organization. Uh, I just don't know what we would have done without our board. Um, Sheila, you're one of our board members, as I am. Uh, so, uh, but we do have a board of uh, 14 members, and it's just an incredible. And the senior leadership, also all God-loving people who have dedicated their life to this ministry. So thank you to LLBN board members 
Thank you to our senior leadership for their contributions, love and support to Ministry of LLBN. That's right. Just, it's a blessing to be part of it um, in any way. And we just thank you so much for supporting, for your prayers. Um, you know, you have, if you can give whatever you can, your prayers, there's tax deductible gifts, um, $150, you know, to keep it going 24 seven, or, you know, it used to be $150 per square foot, but since we've got it built, we're moving towards getting everything, all the mechanical things that need to be done with the ministry to make sure it's brought to you live and, and programming is there and to help um, with the ministry of LLBN. Amen, amen. We thank you so much for that. You know, I'm not ashamed to ask because it's for God's work. I'm not ashamed to ask even people in my community, my family, my brothers, my sisters, when I run into them, I encourage them to give this, this ministry as a donor volunteer myself, as Sheila is as well. It's, it's again, it's, we're not ashamed to ask because it is for his glory to honor God, and especially in those days where the gospel has to be preached all throughout the land. And that's exactly what God empowered us here at LLBN to do, to share the good news of Jesus through so many channels, 24 seven, nonstop around the world Amen. for the $150 an hour. Some folks are able to support 10 minutes, and you know what? That 10 minutes is significant because it does go worldwide, and that 10 minutes help us get around the world, and others able to support 15 or 30 or one hour, and many and I, many have also support a bulk of hours. So thank you for not being ashamed to give us what you can afford because all together, the small and the big, all counts, all counts together, and at the end of each month, we continue to pay our bills for satellite expenses, internet expenses. It's in the tens of thousands of dollars just for the internet. Uh, every viewer who receives the gospel of Jesus who log in, who logs in for every minute, there's costs incurred to LLBN. And you folks, the good folks out there, who's making that possible. Amen. Sheila, should we share a letter or two? Yes. Greg and Thelma from California write, we have enclosed a gift to help with LLBN's ever-growing outreach. Please use it wherever it is needed most. We lift up the LLBN ministry and its team members in our daily prayers. And Harold from Oklahoma says, the Sabbath church services you show are a blessing in our home. I have arranged to put these ceremonies on our local city-owned TV channel as part of a cable TV service to our town. Thank you, LLBN. Oh, God bless you. Harold, thank you so much, Greg and Thelma. We'd love to pray for you. Gannon, would you please pray yes, for Yes, mighty God in heaven, we lift up Greg and Harold before you. Uh, what a great servant of yours. Uh, and there's so many like them out there, Father, uh, just eager to serve your work and to share the good news of your son Jesus into the world. Bless them richly as we ask you to bless all our viewers and all those who love you who are under your watch to be with them and bless them all as you bless this ministry and all of us here at LLB. Thank you, Father, in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sabbath. Stay tuned for church service.
Happy Sabbath. It sure is good to be back in Loma Linda after it is. traveling. So Travel much. was great, but it's good to be back right here on the campus. It really is. And part of our values here at the Loma Linda University Church is growing disciples, but that means growing in areas of worship and study. Bible study and prayer. Also community, community and service and yes. service. So we have some different things we'd like to mention in each of those categories. And I think we have quite a few things coming up with worship and programming. Yeah, we're going to start off with worship. So very, uh, right off the bat, we have a Vespers program coming up October 8. It's sponsored by the Association of Adventist Women. You're going to check our website for the information on that. It is followed by a banquet. The Vespers at 5 p.m. is free. The banquet, it is a ticketed event. You'll go to our website so you can register for that. Also in the category of worship, we're starting a brand new sermon series. Um, it's starting next week, October 1. And there's gonna be some se a seminar in the afternoon. Here's Pastor Randy and Jamie Stadola to tell us more about that. 
I'm really looking forward to our fall sermon series. It's entitled Covenant. It's focused on strengthening our family relationships. We're gonna do some unique things. It'll have a bit of a back to the classroom feel, but important themes and topics for our families. It will be accompanied each Sabbath afternoon by Covenant Conversations. Jamie, you work with our care and counseling department. What are we looking at for the Covenant Conversations? Yes, we'll be continuing the conversation uh, regarding the sermon topic of that day. So each week will be a different topic at 4 p.m. here in room 1402. It will vary a little bit in how it's happening. We'll have some presentation, we'll have some conversation, Q&A kind of environment. And we look forward to having you there. The purpose here is to help strengthen our families. Amen. We look forward to you joining us for Covenant and for Covenant Conversations. And then one more special program that's happening next week, October 1st as well, is the Cal Baptist Choir and Orchestra at 5 p.m. right here in the sanctuary. If you haven't heard them, you're not gonna wanna miss them. And those are all that we have currently for worship. And then in the value of study, we have a new Sabbath school that is starting out. Our Sabbath schools are really our small groups as well here at the church. The Sabbath school starts October the 1st. It is called Peacemaker. This is a Sabbath school that is a biblical approach to conflict resolution. It'll be Sabbath mornings at 1030 in our new family ministry building. If you would like to be involved in this Sabbath school, they would actually like for you to fill out a, a form, a registration, so that they can keep it a small group and they also will have some materials that they will be distributing to you. So if that's of interest to you, go to our website and get more information. Next under the category of community, tonight at 7 p.m. at the Redlands Church. It's a combination of the Loma Linda University Church Crosswalk and the Redlands Church. It's fresh picked improv. It's 7 p.m. for a good laugh, our own Scotty Ray is involved and many others. You're not gonna miss it at 7 p.m. at the Redlands Church. Just saying his name made me laugh. <laughs> Scotty Ray is awesome. Hope yes. you guys come out for that. And then if you are looking for ways to serve, one of our, our values here at the church is to give back and to serve. And so next weekend is actually the Quilters, the 25th and the 26th of September. There's a correction, I think on our slide last week, it said October, but it actually is September the 25th and the 26th, that's Sunday, Monday. And that's this weekend, actually. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I'm losing it's track tomorrow. of time. Yes. It starts tomorrow. It's tomorrow. Yeah. It is in room 105. It starts at nine o'clock, goes to three. It's just a great time for community as well as making quilts for the children's hospital. They have a potluck, people bring some food. So it's a good time. If you are interested in helping out with that, please come out. There uh, is information on our website and Jody Rogers leads that and you, her phone number's there. You can give her a call if you have more questions. Then also we have our you reach they have some very urgent needs here take a look happy sabbath church my name is israel peralta i work with you reach as the community outreach coordinator as we move forward we have needs with the shower trailer and one of the biggest needs we have seen is for underwear and uh, we ask that you could please check out our Amazon wish list. You can see several different items, but we have also placed there underwear that you could buy in bulk. And it's gonna be very helpful as people come to shower, they can come out with new undergarments. Also, we wanna make a big request for more volunteers. We have several students on our wait list um, and we need more volunteers to come and help them either on a Monday, Tuesday, or Thursday. It's only for an hour and a half, you let us know what day works best for you. It's from 6 to 7.30 p.m. You can check out the volunteer application for Excel on our website, and you can also see the Amazon wish list on our Renew website. We continue to ask for your prayers. Thank you and happy Sabbath. And finally, it's hard to believe we're back to school already. In fact, next week is kind of the back to school bash and everything's going on. And Friday evening at 7.30 p.m., they're gonna have a sundown service. And then all four worship services, Sabbath morning, are gonna highlight the back to school. Just a reminder, the Anthem now has two services, one at 10 and 11.30. And so there's a lot going on and there's one more thing going on in the afternoon. 
There is. We're having the longest table, which originally started at Walla Walla College, so we need to give them a shout out yeah. for that. But we're going to try it down here, and I just want to say a huge thank you to the response that we have gotten for hosts. You guys have really um, given stepped back up to the, the plate. yes and stepped up. So we actually have enough hosts now. So we just want to remind those of you who signed up to be a host that it will begin at 1:30. We'll get more details out to you. But again, this is just for university students and we are going to be partnering with the Campus Hill Church to provide over 50 tables for food for our students. And this is a time just to get to know them and just to be hospitable. Well, it's a great thing. We're working with yeah. the chaplain department yes, on campus. We are. And then Campus Hill Church and the Loma Linda University Church. So really trying to be a university church campus. Uh, that that loves experience. on our students. That's right. They need food to start the school year. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, that's our announcements for today. As always, for the latest information, go to our website, LLUC.org. We sure do love you guys, and we hope that this Sabbath day is a blessing to each and every one of you. Have a great Sabbath.
Let's stand together as we sing our call to worship. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Oh, we can do a little better than that, I think. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Hey, I think they heard us all the way across town. Hey, Amen. It's truly good to be in the house of the Lord today. And it's truly good to see your beautiful and smiling faces today. We welcome each of you who are here in person, as well as those of you who are watching online, who may be at home in a hospital bed, in a nursing home, we want you to know that we are praying for you. David said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Someone say amen. amen. I imagine he said that after he had maybe a vegan macaroni and cheese or some vegan ice cream like I love. Have mercy. Now, let me say, if you are in need of a spiritual and delicious spiritual blessing today, turn to your neighbor and say I need a spiritual meal today. And you can get the other meal laid on out the church is over. Someone say amen. Pastor Joey has prepared a sumptuous meal for us today. A sumptuous spiritual meal. And I know that it will bless your heart and your soul. And after you've eaten the meal, enjoyed it, digested it, be a good disciple of Jesus Christ and let someone else know how much you've enjoyed it and bless their souls as well so that they too can know just how good the Lord is. Welcome, welcome to worship. Let us stand for the hymn of praise.
Let us enter into the holy presence of our Lord and King on bended knee. O God, our Father, our holy King, and our friend, dear Lord, we come into your presence this morning and we seek your face. We seek your presence in our lives. Lord, Lord, not only in our hearts, but in this place as we commune together as disciples of yours. Dear Lord, may we make this church a center for discipleship. Lord, we ask that you will help us to train up the children that they might want to become disciples as they observe our lives. Dear Lord, may they want to worship you as they observe the actions of this church. Lord, we ask that you will bless them and may they grow in discipleship. Dear Lord, be with the members of this church here in the sanctuary and abroad as they observe through online. Lord, may they sense your presence. May they know that we want you here in this community. And Lord, may we be the beacon that you have called us to be. As the new students of the new year come on campus, may they know that this church is where they can find Jesus Christ. Lord, as they go through their struggles, just as we do, may they seek your face in this place. There's so many among us, Lord, who have suffered loss. Dear Lord, my family has suffered loss. And I ask that you will come be near those who remain. I ask, Lord, that they may know that we have a great morning to look forward to, that we will be <clears throat> reunited with them, but Lord, best of all, be reunited with you. Thank you for what you have done here and what you are going to do. Lord, it's a dark world, and you sent your son to die for us, and people still rejected him. Lord, now you have sent us into this dark world. I ask, Lord, that we might reflect the character of Christ in kindness with a soft heart, receiving all who would seek you. Bless us in this endeavor, Lord. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. She went to the temple of Jerusalem alone. She was defined by what she didn't have. She didn't have a husband. She didn't have money. But for some reason, she found reasons to be thankful and to give. And she gave everything she had. She was so used to being unnoticed, unseen. She was not a prominent woman. But that day, Jesus was there, and he noticed her. Not only he saw her there, but he also saw her heart. He knew she was giving everything she had. Little this lady knew that for generations, her story will be told, because she gave with a cheerful, grateful heart. And I know that we say God loves us, God takes care of us, He's faithful. I know that as well. But today I would like to connect that truth, not only with my mind, but also with my emotions, with my heart, with my pocket, with my priorities, with the way I relate to people, because His sigh is on the sparrow. And he watches over us. He sees us. He notices us. He's faithful. So today and now, when the deacons collect the offerings and tithe, I 
I pray that we can experience that. That connection with a God that cares, sees, and loves us so much. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. This is your special time, so come on up here. Now you can come straight up here. You don't stop for Lamb's Offering today. We are going to be resuming Lamb's Offering October 8. So I think that all of our members there make note of that tuck your dollars 20s maybe hundreds in there and get ready for october 8. have a seat sit down wow there's so many boys and girls here today i am happy to see you find a little seat well today i want to ask you do you remember what teacher Chris and teacher Scotty talked about for the last two weeks? This is a little quiz for you. Do you remember? They talked about myths. Do you remember what a myth is? Do you remember what a myth is? 
it's when we believe something that isn't necessarily true. We believe a lie, but we think it's real. I want you to look at my piece of paper here. I cut it out into a heart. When we open up our hearts, we allow Jesus to enter our hearts and make us wide and clean and fresh. But you know, Satan likes to tell us lies. Satan likes to make us think that we aren't worth very much. And Satan also likes us to think that no matter what we do, we're never going to be clean and fresh and new again. Have you ever felt that way before? Hmm. Well, this morning, I have a little something that I want you to take one and pass it along. There's one for everybody. It's a little piece of sandpaper. So go ahead, take it, pass it along. Mm-hmm. Does everybody have their sandpaper? Oh my, there are lots of boys and girls this morning. I have lots of them. Preston, can I have you help the other boys and girls start handing a duga? Thank you. Okay, perfect. Does everybody have their sandpaper? Now, I want you to take your sandpaper and I want you to rub it on your hand. Ouch. Does yours hurt? Does it hurt, Wyatt? Yes, it does. Paul? It, it's rough. And sandpaper, if I rubbed long enough, it would probably create a sore. In fact, it's painful. And you know what, boys and girls? Satan wants us to think that when we hear things like, I am not enough, uh, I don't want to forgive somebody, or I am a terrible, terrible person because I made a mistake and Jesus is not going to forgive me. It's like this sandpaper, rough, and it's painful, and it hurts, and it scares us, and it makes us sad. But you know, boys and girls, I want you to take now one of these. Take a piece of cotton, okay? Take a piece of cotton and pass it along. Thank you so much, Sarah, for your help. Does everybody have their cotton ball? Okay, come get your cotton ball. Now, what can we say a cotton ball feels like? What's the one word you can say? Soft. It's soft. Thank you. I heard that all around. It's fluffy. And when you go like this, what does it feel like on your hand? In fact, it's so soft, you could probably even put it on your face and it doesn't hurt. You know, when I think of words and cotton, I think of words like, I forgive you. I am sorry. You know what? I didn't mean to say or do that, and I made a mistake. Those are words that open up our hearts and make us tender and loving towards others so that we in turn can accept Jesus' forgiveness. Satan wants us to think that all our, our feelings inside are crumpled and messy. But you know what? Jesus says, I forgive you, and he wants us to be compassionate, kind, and loving towards others. So this morning, Pastor Joey is going to talk about forgiveness. I think it's okay if you just take your little cotton ball and just rub your hand or your arm as you listen to what he has to say about forgiveness. Thank you for listening. You can go back to your seats now. Oh, thank you so much. I am going to invite the um, Del Sid family to come on up.
Oh, the Del Cid family is dear to me. This is Michael and Nancy, Matthew and Jacob, and this family has been part of children's ministries for many years. In fact, they joined our soccer league. Nancy is a Sabbath school leader for Matthew's class, and she has just stepped up to leadership in our adventure club as well. So we love having them part of children's Hi. ministries. Michael works for the state of California as a parole agent, and Nancy also works for the state of California as a special investigator. And Matthew, can you share with everybody how old you are? Mommy. How old are you? Five. You're five years old. Yes, we Mommy. even practiced that. Matthew is a very active five-year-old. And then we, of course, are here because of Jacob. Now, Jacob was born during the pandemic, and so he wasn't able to get dedicated earlier than this. Today is his second birthday. Happy birthday, Jacob. Yes, that's for you. <laughs> and so this is a special time. The family has lots of active things happening. Um, the kids are very involved in Sabbath school, love VBS, and we just love having them part of that. Now, Nancy, you sent me some of your desires and goals for your family, and I wanted to share that with you this morning. <laughs> One of our deepest desires has been for our boys to grow up in the SDA church and to learn about God's love. We pray that Jacob develops a relationship with God and walks with him for the rest of his life. Jacob loves to sing, dance, and play with his brother Matthew. He also enjoys playing and spending time with mama. He's a little bit of a mama's boy. <laughs> we ask that you pray for us as parents that we may be able to guide our boys in the right path and teach them the love of God. That's beautiful because as parents, we need to know that we have support and people come around us. So I know there is a group of people here who are here to physically support you, so I'm going to invite you to stand at this time. How beautiful. I see your family. I see Sabbath school leaders. Thank you so much. Well, Jacob, you want to come over here? Let's see. You want to come <laughs> over here? We're going to pray for you, Mommy. okay? Okay, yes, we're talking mama. Okay. <laughs> How about I just stand next to you? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask you to bless this precious family that has come before you this morning, Lord. They need your guidance. They need your wisdom as they raise these two beautiful boys. Thank you for Jacob and for the two years you've given him, Lord. And we ask you to bless his family and continue through every year of his life. Lord, we praise and thank you for the blessings that you have poured upon this family, the challenges that they have already faced, and the way that you are going to work with them in the future. Lord, thank you for the support that they have and for the friends and family that come alongside them. We ask you to bless them now today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.
Before we continue with our sermon series, Myths, please read with me the following quotes. God rejoices, not because the problems of the world have been solved, not because all human pain and suffering have come to an end, nor because thousands of people have been converted and are now praising him for his goodness. No, God rejoices because one of his children who was lost has been found. Punishment is way easier than discipline. We think punishment is hard, and it is. But it's nowhere near as hard as actually walking out the process of getting your life cleaned up. I liken discipline to open heart surgery. It's a big operation with a long recovery period. I had to learn a whole new way to live, a whole new way to be me, and I had to be okay with that process taking as long as it took. But in that process, the things that were never addressed the first time, the shame, the guilt, and fear, finally got healed. Punishment only made those things grow in my life. It's not the fear of punishment or the hope of everlasting reward that leads the disciple of Christ to follow him. They behold the Savior's matchless love, revealed throughout his pilgrimage on earth, from the manger of Bethlehem to Calvary's cross, and the sight of him attracts. It softens and subdues the soul. Love awakens in the heart of the beholders. They hear his voice and they follow him. Now let's return to the service. Happy Sabbath, church family. Our scripture reading today is taken from Luke 19, verses 1 to 10, in the New International Version. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, huh, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of all my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Comedian Steve Martin once said, before you criticize a man, walk a mile in his shoes. That way, when you do criticize him, you'll be a mile away and wearing his shoes. <laughs> yeah, it's becoming easier in our society, easier than ever, to criticize people from a mile away. In February of 2020, uh, country music star Garth Brooks, any Garth Brooks fans in here? Everybody like Garth? Yes, yeah, a few of you tentatively raising your hand. Garth Brooks gave a concert in Detroit, Michigan. And he did it while wearing the, the jersey of retired uh, Detroit Lions running back Barry Sanders. But when Garth posted this photo, this photo of himself backstage, it confused some of his uh, followers because they saw the name Sanders and the number 20 and they thought, they assumed that he was conveying support for Senator Bernie Sanders, who at that time was running for president. And as you can imagine, the backlash was immediate and intense. One Twitter, Instagram user wrote, good grief, 
Can't you just do what you get paid to do? Why, why does it have to involve politics? Three exclamation points. So sad. We don't pay good money for anything other than to watch you perform. Thought you were different. Another wrote, weird that a millionaire would, be, would like a socialist. Hey, Garth, are you going to distribute your millions? Only on the internet, right? Now, before we judge these people too harshly, it's important for us to remember that we also can very easily slip into this kind of critical mindset. I mean, think back to this week. How many times did you see someone doing something you disagreed with, saying something you disagreed with, and had your mind immediately jump to criticism? Just as an experiment this week, I decided to keep track of how many times I did that. And let me tell you, the results were not pretty. I'm not going to give you the actual number because I don't want to tempt you to judge me, but it was high. It was a high number. I, mean, I found myself criticizing clerks at the pharmacy for how they organize their aisles. You know, why would they put the adult Claritin in one aisle and the children's Claritin in a completely different aisle? I found myself judging people at, in line at, at, Costco who, who, at Costco Gas who would wait until they got to the pump before they started fiddling around looking for their membership card. I mean, why, why, what were they doing in that 30 minutes they were waiting until they got there? And then of course I found myself criticizing drivers on the road, right? I mean, that's an easy one for cutting people off, for rolling through stop signs, right? It's called a stop sign, not a roll sign, right? I see some of you nodding in agreement. I see others of you judging me for judging you. The truth is, we enjoy judging people. We do. We like criticizing people because it makes us feel good about ourselves. And yet social media has created a venue, a forum, where we can publish our opinions, our criticisms, our judgments on everyone and everything everywhere. And it's created a culture where criticisms are louder than caring. Where we are judged more by our failures than we are by our feats. And where it feels like some failures are so bad that they seem final. That there's no way out. That once we make that critical mistake, we, we wonder if there's any way to get out of it. So while we're judging other people, we are also secretly wondering if others are judging us. Like if they knew the private decisions that I made, would they reject me? Would they mock me? Would they cancel me? See, we're in the end of a series where we've examined the dangerous myths that shape our identity and drive our behaviors. And there is no more dangerous myth than this, that some failures are final. Because that's antithetical to the central message of Scripture and the opposite of what Jesus came here to do. So if failures aren't final, how can we ensure that our failures aren't final for us? To answer that question, we're going to turn to an, an encounter that Jesus had with a, a man who was told that his failures were final. It's found in Luke chapter 19, starting with verse 1. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open them up, turn them on, flip them over to Luke chapter 19. We're going to start in verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. Now, this ac account occurs in the middle section of the book of Luke. See, Luke divides his gospel into three different major sections. The first section deals with Jesus' ministry in Galilee. The middle section deals with Jesus' journey from Galilee to Jerusalem. And the third section deals with Jesus' ministry in Jerusalem. So each of these sections are connected more thematically than they are, are chronologically. And so the theme of this middle section is that no one is outside of the reach of the Savior. No one is outside of the reach of the Savior. So in account after account, Luke describes how Jesus brings outsiders in. A bleeding woman, a blind beggar, a bunch of lepers, those whom society had rejected, Jesus 
restores. But there is no, there is no outsider that the people love to hate more than Zacchaeus. Take a look, verse 2. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. So there's three things, three facts that Luke wants his readers to understand about Zacchaeus. And the first was that he was a tax collector, which was very controversial back then. It's not like now where everybody loves to pay their taxes and can't wait for April 15th. No? No? Well, as much as we hate taxes now, they hated them even more because the Romans came and conquered the Jews and then forced the Jews to pay the Romans for the privilege of being a part of their empire. I mean, that would be like me coming into your home and charging you rent for the privilege of living in your own home. And the tax collectors were Jews who enforced Roman tax laws on other Jews. And the worst of all, they benefited from this betrayal. They, they could set the taxes as high as they wanted. And, and as long as the Romans got their cut, they didn't care. The tax collectors could keep the rest. So, so these tax collectors were despised by their communities. They were hated by their communities. They were on the same level as con men, cheats, Dallas Cowboys, you know? Everybody hated them. Nobody liked them. Amen? No amens? <laughs> you <know>, think, about, <laughs> think about how you feel when you think of a person like Harvey Weinstein. Bernie Madoff, people who take advantage of others for their own benefit. That's who these tax collectors were. And Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector, which means that he was the kingpin. So that's the first thing that Luke, the first fact that Luke wants us to understand about Zacchaeus was that he was the chief tax collector. And the second fact, the second fact was that he was rich which means that he benefited a lot from his unsavory profession. He was very good at doing very bad things. That's how he became the chief tax collector. That's how he became rich. So if there was anyone who deserved to be canceled, if there was anyone who deserved to be rejected, if there was anyone who deserved to have his failures be final, it should have been Zacchaeus. But lucky for him, this is not the end of his story. There is one more fact that Luke wants us to understand about Zacchaeus. And this fact makes all the difference in the world for Jesus. Take a look, verse 3. Zacchaeus wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. You know, a lot of times we get sidetracked by Zacchaeus' height, right? The fact that he was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. But that's not what Luke focuses on. What Luke wants us to understand is how desperately Zacchaeus wanted to meet the Savior. How desperately he was seeking the Savior. This is not some mild curiosity for him. He's not come for the show. He's come to encounter the Savior. He's not there out of curiosity. He wants to meet the Christ. And we know this because of how he behaves. He doesn't give up at the first sign of difficulty. You know, the, when the crowd pushes him aside, which they did. I mean, the way that this passage is written, it's clear that, that the crowd was intentionally getting in his way. And that is a theme throughout the book of Luke. The crowd often gets between the seeker and the Savior. Like when the demoniac clung to Jesus, the crowd pushes him away. When the bleeding woman tries to reach Jesus, the crowd forms a barrier. When the blind man tries to shout out to Jesus, the crowd tries to silence him. The crowd often gets between the seeker and the Savior. And I wonder, do we ever behave like the crowd? Do we ever get between the seeker and the Savior? 
by our words, by our actions, by our beliefs that some failures are final, do we ever get between the seeker and the Savior? I wonder. But despite the crowd's best efforts, Zacchaeus will not be deterred. And so he, he casts aside his dignity and pride and runs, runs to that tree and climbs upon it, which is something that, that people, men and women in that culture just did not do. They did not run and they did not climb trees, which is why author Robert Stein in his commentary on this passage writes, such undignified behavior according to that culture indicates that more than curiosity was at play here. See, Zacchaeus wasn't there just for the show. He was there to encounter the Savior. That's the third fact that Luke wants us to understand about Zacchaeus. He was desperately seeking the Savior. And that fact made all the difference for Jesus. See, the crowd only cared about the first two facts. They only cared that Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector who had become rich by taking advantage of others. And they didn't care about anything else. They were so focused on his past mistakes that they didn't care about his present motivations. They were so blinded by the size of his sin that they didn't care that he was seeking the Savior, but Jesus did. That is the only fact that mattered to Jesus, that Zacchaeus was seeking him. So Zacchaeus' past couldn't prevent him from having a future with Jesus because no failure is final if we seek the Savior. Amen? No failure is final if we seek the Savior. And that's what we find in verse 5. When Jesus reached that spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. And so he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. See, this is no chance encounter. Luke is very clear that Jesus intentionally comes here to meet Zacchaeus. He writes, I must stay at your house today. And the word that we translate must implies a divine necessity. It's a word that Luke uses over and over again in his gospel to show that this is a God-ordained appointment for Jesus. Right? In Luke chapter 4, verse 43, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom. Luke chapter 9, verse 22, the Son of Man must suffer many things. Again, in that same verse, he must be killed and on the third day <clears throat> raised to life. These were divinely ordained appointments. So, meeting Zacchaeus on the road that day was just as much a part of God's plan for, for Jesus' life as him dying on the cross. Did you get that? Meeting Zacchaeus was as much of God's plan for Jesus' life as dying on the cross. I mean, think about that for a second. Zacchaeus has just gone through extreme measures to meet Jesus. I mean, he's, he's, he's gone straight on stalker fan on Jesus, right? He, he climbed a tree. He hung from a branch just to catch a glimpse of Jesus. I don't know if you've ever wanted to meet someone that badly before. I don't know, maybe the Wedgwood Trio, right? Any of, you, any of you go to that concert? That was amazing, weren't they? They were so funny. Maybe the Heritage Singers? The Heritage Singers Bear? No idea why the bear is so popular. I know. Randy Roberts, right? The closest thing that we have to an Adventist celebrity. So imagine, imagine that you camped out. Like you brought your sleeping bag the night before and slept right outside those lobby doors. So as soon as the, the deacons opened them, you could get, come in here and have a great seat. And you sit through the service, listen to the message, and then when it's done, you fight through the crowds, get in line to shake the hand of Randy Roberts. And when you get there and you reach out to shake his hand, he gives you a big Randy Roberts smile as wide as Texas, right? And he calls you by name and hugs you and says, I've been waiting for you. Can't wait to go to your house for lunch today. 
How would that make you feel? I don't know about you, but my heart would break out in song, you know? <laughs> he knows my name, right? <laughs> See, what's amazing about this moment is that as hard as Zacchaeus fought to get to Jesus, Jesus fought even harder to get to Zacchaeus. Come on now. He didn't just come from Galilee. Jesus left the glories of heaven above. He cast aside his dignity and pride and ran, ran to earth and climbed upon that dying tree just to be with Zacchaeus. So if you forget everything else I say to you today, remember this. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter what choices you've made, no failure is final because the Savior, he seeks for you. It doesn't matter if our families abandon us. It doesn't matter if our friends reject us. It doesn't matter if our communities cancel us. We have a Savior who will never stop loving us. The same Savior who fought through a storm and crossed a lake in order to free a demoniac, seeks for you. The same Savior who, who felt the touch of a bleeding woman through the press of the crowd, seeks for you. The same Savior who, who heard the cries of the blind man through the shouts of the crowd, seeks for you. The same Savior who came all the way from Galilee, to meet a tax collector hanging from a tree seeks for you. No failure is final because we have a Savior who never stops seeking for you. See, Jesus, he's a lot like GPS. Anybody here remember those times when we used to use paper maps to try to find out how to go somewhere that we had never gone before. Anybody? Anybody here still use paper maps? Yeah, there, there are some of you out there. Wow, that's incredible. So when I first moved to LA, someone gifted me a Thomas Guide, which was just a big, thick book of maps with every road in Los Angeles. And they would have to keep reproducing this because, of course, they kept building roads, right? And whenever I wanted to go somewhere that I hadn't been before, which was a lot in LA because it was my first time living there, I would have to look up the address in the appendix of that book and find what page that corresponded with and find that page and then sort of reverse navigate myself to my starting point and then kind of memorize those directions because you can't keep flipping the map, right? While you're driving. And that was all before I even got in the car. It was so hard just to drive somewhere you, didn't, you hadn't been before. But then we got MapQuest. Anybody here remember MapQuest? Yeah, some more hands go up. Yeah, MapQuest. And MapQuest made things a lot easier because all you had to do was type in your address, the address you wanted to go through, and then you could print, like on paper, right? Print up a map with instructions on how to go there. The only problem was that if you ever got lost, right? You missed a turn, missed an exit, forget it. You might as well just go back home because there was no map for that. But then we got GPS and all of a sudden it became so much easier to get where we wanted to go. Because we would just type in the address. You didn't even have to know what direction you were heading. I remember having to, is this north? Is this west? Is... You don't have to know any of that. You just type in the, uh, the address and the GPS would give you step-by-step -step instructions of where to go. And now we don't even need the address, right? You just say the name of the place you want to go and then, and then Google Maps or Waze will find the, the, the address and get you there. And what's so amazing is that even when we get lost, even if we miss the turn, the GPS tries to get us back on track, right? Like if you miss a turn, what does, what does the GPS say? Rerouting, right? I can tell that some of you also don't listen to your GPS sometimes, yes. Rerouting, it says rerouting. And even if you miss that same turn over and over again, the GPS never gets frustrated. It just keeps on rerouting and keeps on rerouting because the GPS never stops seeking 
for you. It never stops trying to get you back on the right track. All you have to do is be willing to follow. Amen. And Jesus is a lot like GPS. He never stops seeking for us. He never stops trying to get us back on the right track. All we have to do is be willing to follow. Willing to allow God to reroute our lives. See, that, that is what repentance is. It's just a fancy word for God rerouting our lives. Literally, re repentance is a change of direction. It means we were going one way and we turned around and allowed God to take us a different way. So how then can we repent? Because that's a good question because sometimes there's been a little bit of confusion on what it takes to repent. See, a lot of, a lot of times people think of repentance as confession followed by punishment, right? We say that we're sorry for something and then someone meets out an appropriate amount of uh, punishment for us and then we move on. Because that's what we do in our judicial system, right? We, someone confesses to a crime and then a judge tells them what their punishment will be, and then everybody moves on. But that is not what biblical repentance is. Repentance is not about retribution. It's about restoration. Can you say that again? Repentance is not about retribution. It's not about making sure that the offender suffers the same amount of pain that they cost. It's not about retribution. It's about restoration. It's about God allowing God to repair our lives so that we can be better. So how do we do that? How do we repent in a way that we can be better, that it allows God to reroute our lives? Well, we start by doing what Zacchaeus did. Zacchaeus started by acknowledging what he had done wrong. Zacchaeus acknowledged what he had done wrong. See, the reason why he went searching for Jesus was that he recognized that he had made a mistake, that he had made a lot of mistakes, that he had made choices that took him off God's path for his life. He recognized what he had done wrong. And if we also want God to be able to reroute our lives, if we want to be better, we have to start by recognizing what we've done wrong. We have to ask ourselves, who has been hurt by our choices? How have we hurt ourselves? How have we hurt others? How have we hurt God? How have we added to the brokenness of this world? Recognize what we've done wrong. And that's not easy. That kind of admission is actually very painful, which is why a lot of people avoid it. So instead, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll minimize what we've done rather than maximize our admission. It's kind, of like, it's kind of like the man who cheated on his taxes. He was starting to feel so guilty about what he did. He couldn't sleep at night. So he decided to write a letter. He wrote a letter to the IRS saying, I cheated on my taxes. I put the wrong numbers down. I can't sleep at night. So here's a check for $1,500. And then he added at the end, if I still can't sleep at night, I'll send you the rest. <laughs> now we laugh, but that's exactly what we do, right? We minimize, we minimize what we've done instead of maximizing our admission because it's painful. But it is the only way for God to begin to reroute our lives. It's the only way to be better is to make a full confession and ask for forgiveness. So that's the first step in this repentance process, is to recognize what we've done wrong. And the second is to realize why we've done wrong. See, after we've recognized what we've done wrong, it's important for us to realize why. This process of repentance begins, it begins with confession, but it continues through self-examination, which is why in Psalm chapter 139, the psalmist writes, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. See, the outward sins that we commit are a result of an inward brokenness. 
I love how Dr. George Knight describes this in his book, I Used to Be Perfect. Eve <clears throat> committed sin, in capital letters, when she loved herself and her desire more than she loved God and his will. She committed sin in her heart, and that sin in her heart led to the taking and eating of the fruit. Sin in the heart leads to sins in terms of actions. Something happens in the heart first. First, there is sin in the heart. That sin in the heart then gives birth to sinful actions. Thus, sin leads to sin. Notice that Dr. Knight associates sin with love because sin at its core is a misplaced love. It's loving something or someone more than we love God. So when we commit sin, sinful actions, at its root is a love for something, wealth, power, belonging, acceptance, pleasure, comfort. These are not bad things, but sometimes we love them more than we love God. We love them so much that we're willing to sin in order to get them. So what is the sin that drives, what is the love that drives our sin? What is the desire that drives our behavior? See, all of us are warped in different ways inside. So some of us may lie because we want to belong. We want people to accept us, so we lie. Others of us lie because we, we want to manipulate or control others. We don't trust them, so we lie. The outward action is the same, but the inward desire is different. So if we want, to, we want God to reroute our lives, if we want to be better, we have to, we have to ask ourselves, why? We have to realize why we sin. Why do we do wrong? So that's the second step. We start by recognizing what we've done wrong. Then we move to realizing why we've done wrong. And then we move, finally, to the how. How do we begin to repair the damage we've caused? See, the amazing thing about God is that he doesn't take away our agency. And what I mean by that is, we don't have to be parents for very long before we realize that we can't do everything for our children, right? That actually, by trying to do everything for our children, we stunt their growth. So even if we can do something better as their parents, we allow our children to do it so that they can learn and they can grow. In psychological circles, they refer to this as giving a sense of agency or a sense of control. And God, like a great parent, does not take away our agency. That's why he invites us to partner with him in, in repairing some of the messes that we've made. I mean, notice in this story, in this encounter, Zac the process of repentance begins for Zacchaeus when he recognizes what he's done wrong. But it isn't until he begins to repair some of his messes that Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. Take a look, verse 8. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. So he promises to try to repair some of the mess he's made. And that's when Jesus says to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. And then I love how this passage ends. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. See, that's why Jesus came. That's why the Savior came to seek sinners. Amen. Friends, this process of repentance will not be easy. It's going to take fight. It's going to take us casting aside our dignity and pride. It may even take us climbing some trees to get there. But it is the only way. It's the only way for God to reroute our lives. It's the only way to be better. And the good news is we're not in this process alone. As hard as we're fighting to be with Jesus, Jesus is fighting even harder to be with us. 
So begin this process of repentance. Recognize what? Realize why? And then begin to think through how to repair some of the mess we've made. And we'll discover that no failure is ever final because we have a Savior who will never stop seeking for us. sing that with me again. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know, and I know he watches I know he watches, oh, and I know he watches me. Our good and gracious God, our God who watches over us more than a hundred thousand sparrows. We want to thank you for being a Savior who constantly seeks, who never stops seeking for us. Help us to never stop seeking for you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. 
Amen. We invite you, sorry, we invite you to stay and contemplate the message of God through the postlude.
Welcome to Week in Review. I'm Sheila Hodgkin here with Ganem. Everyone knows Ganem. How are you, Ganem? Everyone knows Sheila. <laughs> I am blessed and I trust you as well. I am too. We're, we're blessed. And I know you're blessed out there too. And um, our verse of the day, can I start with that? Please. But the Lord watches over those who fear him, those who rely on his unfailing love. Psalms 33, 18. That's really beautiful and comforting, isn't it? It really is, because um, if, if we pray, we know that he listens and he hears us. And if we love him and fear him, we know he's watching over us. So. And if we're under his watch, why should we fear anything? Although we're humans mm -hmm. and we do experience fear and insecurities uh, and stress. But at the end of the day, if we keep reminding ourselves, who is our father? And then... We should have nothing to worry about. That's right. Nothing to worry about when we have God as our Father. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for choosing that verse. Well, I love that verse. That's been a, been a stronghold for me. So, love that. Well, we have four sponsors. We do. We have the Bliss family from Georgia, the Jacob family from Pennsylvania, the Gilbert family from Alabama, and the Marshall family from Tennessee, God mm. bless you, and we thank you so much for sponsoring this hour. We have sponsors every 24-7, and um, but we specifically are thanking these sponsors for this hour, so thank you very much. Yeah, and you said, you, you're absolutely right. It's miraculous. It is amazing, heartwarming. Every half hour throughout a 24-hour cycle, we have sponsors. Now, they don't choose the half hour or hour. It is our computer system. Just kind of select the Sabbath, you know, those who happen to be read on the Sabbath life hours. Uh, so it just kind of randomly keeps picking up the, the names. But every time you watch LLBN, you have to remember the amazing faith by all those names who appear on the screen. What a faith in God's work that they're putting their trust in a ministry from distance mm -hmm. to help us go in the airways and get back on the grounds in every city around the world. That's right. We have wonderful prayer partners and wonderful viewers like you that support this ministry. We can't do it without you. So Amen. God bless you. So big thank you. And absolutely, I second that over and over again. God bless you for your support. You are our congregation. You are the family of this ministry that keeps going for 27 years now, Sheila. 27, just as old as I am. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't doubt that. But, but for those of us who've been in it from day one till now, it has just been a phenomenal journey seeing not what we did, but what God allowed us to do and what God empowered us to do. A testimony for all believers, if you believe in him and put your faith in him, whether in personal life, ministry, or business, he will get you through all troubles. He will get you through everything and help you to cross and accomplish many milestones. Amen. Amen. That's right. Well, we had a wonderful Christian Connections, and if you missed it, this last Tuesday live, you get to watch it one more time. Right, Adam? That's right. I'm actually looking forward to watch I this one watch again. I want to watch it again. We had the wonderful Dr. Anthony Hilliard, and he talked about um, eating to live and living to eat, you know, uh, which one's better? You'll have to tune in and, and find out. I sincerely say this is one you don't want to miss because you don't hear these topics, these discussions coming from scientific people. You go on the internet, YouTube, Google, whatever, and you get a hodgepodge of variety of information and answers so vary from answer to answer for on the same topic that you search. But here it's presented scientifically. And if you see all the credentials that Dr. Hilliard has, you will trust what he is telling us. So tune in for yes. the replay. It, it is outstanding. And I love how s s the science and the spirituality, the trust in God. That's right. Goes together. So don't miss it. And, and that's this wonderful music we had too. And that's an excellent point you raised about the mixture, you know, and he puts it so simple for all of us to understand. He, you know, as, as, as advanced he is scientifically, he brought it in, into very, very average language for all of for us to every understand. every language, for me. 
for people well, for like me. me. So <laughs> if I can understand it, you will too. So. All right, what we got next? Well, we also have um, the angel's message. There's a two-hour special coming up. You want to talk That's about that, That's correct. Gavin? That's correct. So this coming Tuesday, mark your calendar. It's a very, very special program. Uh, we're trying to bring you one each month. A two-hour special, a mixture of music, discussion, sermons, and a variety of topics. Uh, the three angels' message are a part. The three angels' message are a part of the prophecy of Revelation 13 through 14 that contrasts true and false worship and the battle between Jesus and Satan. These messages are directly from Jesus to his people. They are an invitation to each individual and an end time imperative. So uh, it is deep. Uh, most Adventists are familiar with the three angels message, but you know, it doesn't hurt to always hear it from another teacher's perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's going to be that message is going to be broken down into four segments uh, uh, to be presented by Dr. Uh, uh, Roger Schwelt. Oh, so. awesome. I love him, too. And he's another wonderful doctor that puts he, it together for us. He is indeed. Succinctly. So, well, especially being a scientific person, he knows how to assemble the blocks in a way mm -hmm. that it all connects. And he had his st studies in theology himself. So, so we thank God for this opportunity. So Tuesday, 6 p.m., live Pacific time here on His Word channel. And we also have uh, the October SLS schedule. And Ganem, do you have that schedule down, Pac? Mm -hmm. So make sure to go to LLBN.TV, the same website. We have all our resources there for you. Uh, click on schedules on the top of the screen, as you see on the screen, uh, and have a pull down win uh, window. Or you can click on the channel name, SLS, and that will get you directly to that channel page. And in there, you'll be able to click on schedule and see the schedule. Uh, there are lots of new programs airing on that channel. Uh, you definitely want to uh, uh, watch Dr. Hilliard. Hilliard. He has his own series now, uh, premiering October 2nd on Smart Lifestyle TV. We call it SLS. Uh, and as well as uh, another series by Dr. Roger Schwelt. Uh, on health as well, among many other health programs. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, our health channel, it is just growing left and right in all directions worldwide and heavily in America and Canada because of its uh, 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 scientific-based health teaching. And again, it's not the hodgepodge, you know, confusion of information as you find on YouTube or Google or other yes, places. Yes. That's great. That's so, wonderful. I can't wait. You have to tune in and make sure to check your schedule. And Gannon, we also want to tell you, we are just so grateful for the growth of this ministry. For 27 years, it has just grown exponentially. And um, that's due to God. We take no credit, but just from God through all of you folks. And um, we want to thank the board and the senior leadership. Anything to add with that? Yes, I, I do want to say something about the... Our board members are the most incredible, gentle-hearted, yet brilliant business people who've done all kind of business in their, throughout their careers, and they're loving and humble to be part of our organization. Uh, I just don't know what we would have done without our board. Um, Sheila, you're one of our board members, as I am. Uh, so, uh, but we do have a board of uh, 14 members, and it's just an incredible. And the senior leadership, also all God-loving people, who have dedicated their life to this ministry. So thank you to LLBN board members. Thank you to our senior leadership for their contributions, love and support to ministry of LLBN. That's right. Just, it's a blessing to be part of it um, in any way. And we just thank you so much for supporting, for your prayers. Um, you know, you have, if you can give whatever you can, your prayers, there's tax deductible gifts. Um, $150, you know, to keep it going 24-7, or, you know, it used to be $150 per square foot, but since we've got it built, we're moving towards getting everything, all the mechanical things that need to be done with the ministry to make sure it's brought to you live and, and programming is there and to help um, with the ministry of LLBN. Amen, amen. We thank you so much for that. You know, I'm not ashamed to ask because it's for God's work. I'm not ashamed.
to ask even people in my community, my family, my brothers, my sisters, when I run into them, I encourage them to give this, this ministry as a donor volunteer myself, as Sheila is as well. It's, it's again, it's, we're not ashamed to ask because it is for his glory to honor God, and especially in those days where the gospel has to be preached all throughout the land. And that's exactly what God empowered us here at LLBN to do, to share the good news of Jesus through so many channels, 24-7, nonstop around the world, Amen. for the $150 an hour. Some folks are able to support 10 minutes, and you know what? That 10 minutes is significant because it does go worldwide, and that 10 minutes help us get around the world, and others able to support 15 or 30 or one hour, and many and I, many have also support a bulk of hours. So thank you for not being ashamed to give us what you can afford because all together, the small and the big, all counts, all counts together, and at the end of each month, we continue to pay our bills for satellite expenses, internet expenses. It's in the tens of thousands of dollars just for the internet. Uh, every viewer who receives the gospel of Jesus who log in, who logs in for every minute, there's costs incurred to LLBN. And you folks, the good folks out there, who's making that possible. Amen. Sheila, should we share a letter or two? Yes. Greg and Thelma from California write, we have enclosed a gift to help with LLBN's ever-growing outreach. Please use it wherever it is needed most. We lift up the LLBN ministry and its team members in our daily prayers. And Harold from Oklahoma says, the Sabbath church services you show are a blessing in our home. I have arranged to put these ceremonies on our local city-owned TV channel as part of a cable TV service to our town. Thank you, LLBN. Oh, God bless you, Harold. Thank you so much, Greg and Thelma. We'd love to pray for you. Gannon, would you please pray yes, for Yes, mighty God in heaven, we lift up Greg and Harold before you. Uh, what a great servants of yours. Uh, and there's so many like them out there, Father. Uh, just eager to serve your work and to share the good news of your son Jesus into the world. Bless them richly as we ask you to bless all our viewers and all those who love you who are under your watch to be with them and bless them all as you bless this ministry and all of us here at LLB. Thank you, Father. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sabbath. Stay tuned for church service. When we